All right, looks like we're live. Uh, if you're if you're having sound, if I'm having sound issues, you can tell me on the chat. It's kind of like the usual ritual. Uh, welcome everyone watching the stream right now, and those who are going to be watching the recording. As the title suggests, today is going to be a stream on the Trinity, according to Saint Gregory the Theologian and his theological orations. If you want to, uh, you know, of course, like, share the stream to everyone. Um, if you want to financially support my channel, you can send this in the stream by Super Chat. Uh, and you can donate to my Patreon as well. If you want some added benefits to subscription, allow me to... Uh, allow me to promote my stream right now if you if you have questions during the stream you can send me a super chat and i'll answer it for you um so having said all of that this is going to be we're going to be focusing on the trinity a bit more deeper than compared to the you know orthodox christian explains the trinity video where we're going to be looking at the five theological orations of saint Gregory the theologian which, which is orations 27 to 31 and in fact, there are also two letters that we're going to be looking at in this video today as well, which is going to be the letters to Cladonius. These are Christological letters. So uh, those who might, you know, those who might not be, for example, Christian or those who, uh, you know, might be wondering who even is St. Gregory the Theologian? Why do we care what he says? You know, what does it matter? Well, if you're a Protestant, well, it doesn't matter because... For Protestants, any Christian history before the 16th century really doesn't matter, right? They might say it, you know, inward, inward only, you know, oh, we care about uh, some of the church fathers. You, if it's St. Augustine, maybe, right? But even though, you know, he contradicts you in many instances, but they, they tend to treat church fathers as if they were like, as if philosophers treat other philosophers, which is really not how they're supposed to be treated. I mean, that's not how... Christians so other Christians they didn't treat each other as philosophers or anything like that they treated each other as if like they were some sort of successors right like those in the past and and so on and so forth the Saint Gregory the theologian kind of like a, a short little guide to his life is that in the he was a Christian bishop in the fourth century he was a friend of Saint Basil the Great who's another great theologian uh, he's one of the three people now there's some people that say there's four some people may, might even say more but uh, there are even more people with this name, but he's one of the three people in the church that has the name theologian. Uh, the other two is Saint Simeon, the new theologian, and Saint John, uh, the evangelist. Right, so the author of the book of John, the book of Revelation, and the epistle of John. You know that John, right? Only those three had the title theologian, and they're not called theologians because they were so scholastic and all of this kind of stuff of course you know i'm not criticizing the idea of using it. i mean this is what we're going to be, do be doing in the stream uh but what he was called a theologian because both spiritually he was a great theologian by his prayer and scholastically speaking he was a great theologian as we're going to be seeing in the stream so you're going to be witnessing in the stream so having said that, i think we can just we can just kind of just start What's with, with the theological orations? Oh, to kind of continue with St. Gregory the Theologian's life, of course. He's a 4th century bishop. He was a friend of St. Basil. In fact, he became bishop out of his own will. St. Basil was, in fact, kind of who forced him to be a bishop. Um, and he kind of didn't appreciate that for a long time of his life. But uh, his main drive was asceticism. So he was... His main thing that he wanted to do for his whole life was to just pray in like in seclusion. That was the whole thing. He kind of was just forced into becoming a bishop and pastorally looking after people. And he was most notably important during his tenure in Constantinople. And in fact, the five theological orations, I believe the five theological orations happened while he was in Constantinople. So the reason why they're called theological orations is it because they're the only theological orations he makes? Actually, that's not true. There are other orations he makes that are even more detailed and more in-depth, but the five theological orations are called that. One of the reasons is because these are orations made before the Second Ecumenical Council, right? The Council of First Constantinople, where you had the, the version of the creed that we have today, right? So he was kind of the, 
the engineer of that. You know, he's one of the engineers of that happening. And he was after the death of the Antiochian bishop, uh, who, by the way, was out of communion with Rome. Uh, he became the presiding bishop over the council, but then due to political intrigues that happened, he kind of just uh, he kind of just walked away and just said, "Screw you guys, I'm going home." And he just literally just went home <laughs> after that. Um, but a lot of his contributions in the Second Ecumenical Council were indeed used, and so he is. You can say the theology of the Second Ecumenical Council is really the theology of Saint Gregory the Theologian. Um, he also, you know, his father also is Saint Gregory the Elder. He's also a saint, right? So his a lot of his relatives, a lot of his friends, they were also saints in the Orthodox Church as well. So you can kind of see that his whole circle was very particularly holy. Now, of course, if you if you read the translation from uh, if you read the translation from the 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 book that I read, this is published by Saint Vlad's Press. This was translated by, I believe, a couple of I believe it was translated by Anglicans. Now, the way they kind of treat, they basically treat Saint Gregory as if he was a kid or something like that. It's pretty disrespectful, in fact, how they treat him. And it's all because Saint Gregory, and we will see in this, in the especially the first theological oration. His first theological oration, I mean, is kind of just one of the things that he says. For example, against Eunomians is that Eunomians are effeminate. Right? That's one of the criticisms he makes. These people are. He says these people are not men. They are low T. They're low testvinis. And, you know, these are the reasons why these people are saying, oh, you know, he was a mean, he was whatever. Um, which is obviously just goes to show the kind of disconnect in mindset that these people have. That the moment you stop being nice, suddenly you're not a Christian anymore, right? That's, that's what these people think. That's what makes you not a Christian. You know, being a heretic, that's okay. But uh, being mean, that's not okay. That's how these people, this is how their minds work. So, um Greetings to everyone in the super chat, super chat, in the live chat today. Hello, Pano, especially to you, sir. Thank you for your service. And let's start with the first theological oration, uh, which is oration 27. And this oration isn't really theological, to be honest. It's kind of just like an introductory oration, so to speak, where he talks about eunomians and eunomianism. Um, and... Again, I say it's not very theological. It is th it is spiritually theological. Okay, so he has a lot of spiritual wisdom that he's dispensing in the 27th oration. It's just that it's not scholastic. The other four theological orations are indeed very scholastic in nature, but the first one is very, very spiritual. It's very pastoral and explains kind of the nature of his opponents that really are opponents because we're talking about eunomians here. So for those who don't know, eunomians were an extreme form of Arians who believed that the Father and the Son were completely dissimilar in nature. So they were completely and utterly dissimilar in nature and that we can know the essence of the Father just as much as the Father knows his own essence. And this is why he, take, he takes a lot of effort in talking about how the essence is unknowable and all this, all this stuff. But uh, the, the Eunomians were again, they were kind of like the main, after Arianism, they were the kind of the main they were like an upgraded version of Arianism, so to speak. And we, we've already done the stream on, on, Ar on Eunomianism, how the West became atheist. And one of the arguments I make is that many of the Eunomian presuppositions, such as the identity thesis or, you know, absolute divine simplicity or neoplatonic simplicity, all three of these things are basically referred to the same thing. Uh, many Western presuppositions regarding the identity thesis, where all things about God has to be identical to each other, there cannot be distinctions. These are one, this is one of the presuppositions of eunomianism, for example. And um, that has, unironically, it did indeed cause the West into becoming atheistic because really when you adopt that system, but you reject some of the points of eunomianism, you go to the opposite extreme. So you say, from we can know God to actually we don't know God at all. If you can't know God at all, then how can he exist, right? Very simple argument. Uh, it has epistemically destroyed knowledge of God. And you see, still, st you still see today some academics, pseudo-academics or pseudo-theologians, 
trying to make these arguments against the essence energies distinction and try to say oh it's an epistemic distinction all this kind of stuff and you or people who adopted his scheme ran into it. First theological oration, where St. Gregory the Theologian starts with the behavior of eunomians, and he has a very st strict warning against those who constantly speak about theology. You know, you let's say you go to a friend's wedding, you know, you approach your friend, you're like, oh man, how are you going? You know, oh man, you're going to marry... Gonna marry this woman, you know. Oh man, I hope it works. By the way, uh, when are you gonna become Trinitarian? <laughs> or when are, you, when are you become gonna become like a Muslim or Christian or whatever? You know, these are the kinds of people that he is attacking. You know, those who they they, can, they can't even talk like normal people. In fact, I remember I don't know which history book, but there was a there was a history book that pointed out that at, like in the third and fourth centuries, well, really the fourth century in the fourth century. It was impossible to walk around the streets without someone like making a theological argument to you, like people debating about homo usion and all all of these things. And like you're trying to, you go to the market and you're trying to, hey, can I get some apples? And say, uh, uh, hey, you know, homo usion or homo homo usion? He's like, what? What are you talking about? It's like, oh, I'm talking about Christ, bro. Thank you, but I, I want to buy apple. I don't want to talk about religion with you, sir. I want to talk that with my priest. But you know, people were really like, that's one of the things he's criticizing is that people were. People treated this as if it was like some, they were talking about sports events. Like, oh, did you see the red team won, beat the blue team yesterday? You know, in, in that manner. And it was very, very, very sacrilegious. So a lot of people, you know, some people, when we point out that, you know, icon profile pictures are sacrilegious, and the it's the kind of same principle that is be, being applied here. Theology is not something you can just talk about, you know, like, like you, you're just going out for a beer and you're like, Oh man, you know, it's kind of crazy that like like these are serious topics, you know, you can't just like frivolously without appropriate knowledge just talk about these things. You have to have a certain character, a certain knowledge and a certain expertise in order to, you know, extensively talk about this and especially if some you have someone like that in like your group. The better attitude is you kind of just listen to them. Right? Just listen to them. So St. Gregory is not really attacking the idea of you know, people having disputes. It is just that they take it to the extreme. So he quotes Sirach uh, 3.1 where, you know, he says, where it says, everything has its own due season. Everything has a time. It has a place. You know, you're not going to be talking about uh, the divine energies during a funeral, right? You're not going to be talking about anything like that. You're not going to be talking about um, Christology during a... I don't know, when you're hunting with your friends, right? when you're going out to hunt with your friends, you're playing sports or something. It's not useless, but again, there's a time and place for everything. So you got to be normal. You don't want to be, you don't want to be normie, right? And the normie is the other extreme. Normie is just, he doesn't speak about anything and he just is concerned about the things of the world. You want to be normal, but you don't want to be normie. That's what St. Gregory is telling you. And uh, we must also, if you're going to be talking about theology, if you're going to know theology, we got to practice it too, right? I mean, all of this, the, the scholastic theology, it's kind of just a waste of time if you don't practice it. So you see people online with those painting avatars, with the red glowing eyes, and all of these people who act like spurgs. Don't discuss anything with them. These people are crazy. They're insane. They're out of their mind. St. Gregory Theology is talking against those kinds of people. They go on Twitter and they make all of these statements. They don't even know what they're talking about. They read a couple of books and they think they are geniuses. But you know what happens? In two, three years, they read more and more and more. You know what they realize? They realize, oh, oh shoot, I don't know anything. So that now they're trying to play this healthy position of like, I know everything and I know nothing. And then eventually, hopefully, they end up realizing, wow, I actually don't know what the heck I was talking about. Oh God, sorry, <laughs> you know? Um, hopefully by that time it's not late because, you know, again, these people will say a lot of crazy things and some guy, for example, recently on Twitter said that Christopher Columbus refuted St. Gregory Palamas because St. Gregory Palamas' geography was wrong. What? <laughs> you, know, the, you know, you get pe people like this. You don't want to be dealing with idiots like that, all right? You want to stay far away from them 
as much as possible. By the way, thank you for the three dollar super chat, Robo Chief. Although I don't, if you have a message, I can't see it. It's blank, but I really appreciate the three dollars. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service. Um. So again, we, it's you know. What I'm saying can be misconstrued as don't talk about theology. I'm not saying that. If I said that, I'll be contradicting myself. That's what I'm doing right now. What I'm saying is that, again, there's a time and place for everything. And you have to know your audience. You don't want to talk vainly. You need to talk at the right time. And when people ask you to, again, one of the things that cringe is when people debate with their parents. I don't think it's wrong. I just think it's strange, especially if their parents are not the ones initiating it. If they are the ones asking you questions, you have the full right to explain yourself. But if you're going to like just walk up to them and just like say something about this stuff, you're kind of just like looking for a fight, you know? you got to be stable. you got to have stillness. And you can see that many of the uh, spiritual things that St. Gregory is promoting in, this, um, in the first oration, a lot of it is related to what we today call hesychasm. So hesychasm is not some 14th century innovation. Hesychasm existed for a long time. In fact, I believe in the seven. There is Cosmos Indicoplutes or something like that. Um, I think he was a monotelite or some heretic, but he was a eighth-century historian, and he will note about the hesychasm in India. He said there will there were hesychasm in India. There was hesychasm there, um, which tells you actually a lot, right? It does tell you a lot. Um, it does it. It doesn't mean that you know some Roman Catholics might say, "Oh, that's proof that hesychasm is Hindu." It's like. You guys were in communion with them at that time. What are you talking about, <laughs> right? Those are your people <laughs> at that time. So you got to be careful about what you're saying, right? Are you saying your church was Hindu? No, of course not. Uh, one of the other arguments, and this is related to the kind of painting avatar with the red glowy eyes people who LARP as theologians. Eunomians, he gets to the Eunomians, he says, Eunomians, one of the claims they make is that the Orthodox are apparently too philosophically poor. You're not philosophical enough, they will say. I'm not joking. You're not philosophical enough. I saw a tweet again recently. Someone said that, uh, I really don't understand how Orthodoxy can be appealing. It's so philosophically, like it's not as complex as, you know, scholasticism and Roman Catholicism. It's, even Islam is more appealing. The guy says even Islam is more appealing. Roman Catholics and Muslims shaking hands together, as always, because they have the same presuppositions. I mean, Roman Catholics say we worship the same God as Muslims, so of course they're gonna they're gonna you know simp for them. But this is a critique again. This Roman Catholic critique you hear today, you know, means use it against the Orthodox too. And do you know what Singular theology did? He say no. Actually, we are complex. No, he said it is not a bad thing to not be complex. In fact, there are many patterns in life for fitting for each person according to the mode in which they live. So for some people, being complex is a good thing, and the the theology provides for that. Or theology is indeed actually quite complex when you get very deep into it. But it is also very simple for those who are simple-minded. right? So, or faith is both for the fools, for Christ, and it is also for the scholastic theologians. It's for both of them. Whereas Roman Catholic, it, it, for Roman Catholicism, it's also both for them too. But the difference is they make a separation, right? So for them, they will say the fools for Christ, they don't know any theology. They're just crazy people who just happen to worship Christ. Actually, we will say the fools for Christ were theologically astute in their own way, in their own manner. It is just that their practices were a lot more straightforward, which we can't really, you know, we who are normies, we can't understand compared to them. Um, so there is no separation. But all of these different modes, so notice they're different. There's a diversity of living and walking down the narrow path, right? Um, there are, in fact, he quotes uh, John 14, 2, where Christ says that there are many mansions that are filled uh, and he argues that these there are many mansions. It's not just one mansion where every lives. There are many mansions. And this points out the different modes in which they exemplify Christian goodness. Uh, and yeah, and then Matthew 7, 14, 
So there's only one way to truth and the path to truth is a narrow one, but it has many branches leading to that one path, right? Many branches leading to that one path. So there's unity and diversity at the same time in sacred theology. Not only is theological taught, but also again his practical spiritual taught. As you can, by the way, as you can guess, there's a lot of things to talk about. We're still in the first theological oration here. Then he quotes uh, Saint Paul saying, "Our old prophets in First Corinthians twelve nineteen, saying that you know for some people, doing this stuff is just not. They just don't get it. You know, they still need to learn the basics, but the deeper stuff." They're not just ready for it, right? So you also need to understand, okay, is this person ready for like the really deep stuff or should I just say what we confessionally believe and just answer whatever questions he has on his mind? You know, you have to know the kind of people you're talking to. And then he kind of just says about, you know, people who just constantly endlessly speculate about stuff. It just tells them, you know, go speculate about useful stuff that does not damage your soul. Because if you talk about God, and you make a severe mistake about your doctrine on God, you're not going to go to hell. Like, he kind of just says that. I mean, you're, you, we can't, you can't afford to miss the mark about divine doctrines. I mean, this is, in fact, a very spiritually dangerous task. All right? So that will put me in a dangerous spot. I know exactly what I'm doing. Well, I know exactly what I'm doing, meaning that I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. Uh, if it's not for everyone. You have to be, first of all, you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself. You have to be very stable in your mindset. You have to have uh, some form of humility. Not saying that I am so humble. I'm not humble at all. You have to have some humility because if you don't have humility, and this is a very easy demonstration. Maybe I can even make a video talking about this specifically, but... If you don't have humility, you're never going to learn anything. That's just a fact, okay? Why? Because if you don't have humility, you're going to think that I'm better than these people. Well, if someone is trying to tell you something and you, in your mind, think I'm better than this person, then you're obviously not going to listen and take what they say seriously. If you don't take what they say seriously, you're never going to understand the new information they're giving to you. If you don't understand the new information they're giving to you, then you're not going to learn. You're not going to learn new things, right? So, you, so humility is very important to learn new things. And when I say humility, I'm not talking about just, um, oh, I'm so humble because I submit to the Pope. That's not humility. That's not humility, okay? Uh, that is, you're just saying, I'm a slave to an earthly man and an earthly seat. And, I mean, th the slave term, not like, you know, you could say we're, we're freed slaves to God. I mean, the slave mindset is actually not really that fitting i mean it's it has its uses i'm not saying it doesn't have its uses but to the extent that for example muslims use we don't use it to the same extent right because we don't we don't remain slaves we are freed we, ha we achieve freedom in christ but having said all of this the this will conclude the first theological um oration 23 minutes, okay, that, that's the short one, all right, so we go, we're in for a ride, ladies and gentlemen, we're in for a ride, because there's a lot of things St. Gregory talks about, again, I, when I was reading and taking notes, I was kind of like, oh man, this is kind of just short, you know, but then now that I'm looking at the notes, like, how many notes do I have, I wonder, uh, seventy-nine entries, which is, you know, quite a lot. Uh, so now we're into the second theological oration. So what is the second theological oration about? Oration 28. This is titled Oration on God. So this oration is specifically about the divine nature. Oration 29 is, I believe, about the Son. Oration 30 is also about the Son. Oration 31 is about the Holy Spirit, right? And then we have the two letters to Cladonius, which are quite short very shorter in comparison to what we're dealing with and they are christological in nature so of course the crystal christological debates weren't really hyper developed like it was at the time of chalcedon but uh, saint gregory still has many important contributions in his letters to cladonius which is why we're going to be looking at them but now we're going to be looking at the second theological oration oration on god and this oration is going to be about the father the son the holy spirit together 
So it's also about it's about the Trinity, but it's more so about the divine nature and you know what we can speak of about the divine nature. Um, it is about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that the Father may approve the Son, aid, and the Holy Spirit inspire it. Or rather, the single Godhead, single radiance by mysterious paradox, one in its distinctions and distinct in its connectedness, may enlighten it. So, unity, one and many, unity and plurality. It's kind of what is the basis of this oration. I have to kind of take pauses because I, I ate recently, so... Uh, Anyways, so he kind of makes an analogy between the law and nature because the law, for example, is hidden, but it also has obvious visible aspects to it. And so likewise, nat the nature of God, the divine nature, is something that is not seen. The only one that can apprehend the divine nature is the Trinity. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, only they know of the divine nature. No one else can comprehend it. It's incomprehensible. Right? It's beyond the comprehension. I think that's a much better way to explain because the in statements, right, which is an exclusion, usually people think of, for example, incorporeal, right? When we say incorporeal, it means, you know, you're not corporeal. That is, you don't have body. So it's like, it's as if God lacks something. But that's not what we mean. When we say incorporeal, we say that God is beyond corporeality. And the advantage of the beyond language is that it allows you to state that God can manifest in corporeality and it doesn't contradict his nature. In fact, uh, in this is kind of an aside, but St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, and I'm, I've been reading this book, Transformation of Divine Simplicity by Galavit, St. Gregory of Nyssa says that because God is goodness, right? he is essentially goodness itself, the only thing that contradicts God's nature is evil. Evil is the only thing that contradicts God. So, God can take on corporeality. God can take on these human attributes. They don't contradict Him. Humanity is not contradictory to God because humanity is not evil. The only thing that contradicts God is evil. So, if Christ cannot be man, then human nature is evil. That's basically what that logic goes to, right? In St. Gregory of Nyssa. And I think it's a it's actually a very sound argument. Um, I believe he says... Mm, okay, so he, he says, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, Let them demonstrate that the birth, the upbringing, the growth, and the advance towards natural maturity, the experience of death, and the rising from death are vicious. Alternatively, if they claim that the things which we mentioned are free of vice, they will necessarily agree that foreignness to vice is in no way shameful. And so, God can become incarnate as man. So, to kind of get back to the nature is something that is not seen. So, it's beyond visibility. It's invisible. Only God can apprehend it. So, we can think of the essence in terms of analogies like the sun, Right? You cannot ever direct now. Obviously, if you're if you're if you have sunglasses, if you're crazy enough, you can look at the you can look at the sun directly. But you know, if you don't have any any protection, basically think of it that way. You cannot look at the sun directly. It is too powerful for our eyes to see. But we can look at you know the shadows cast it. We can look at the light of the sun, right? Uh, and St. Gregory kind of gets into, like, kind of, it's a bit of a speculative ish argument, but he says, well, he argues that those that are incorporeal or naturally closer to the essence, like the soul or the angels, uh, have a better comprehension of God. So if you, have, if you lead a spiritual life, then it's connected with spirituality. If you live a spiritual life, then we move from the earth, we move from the material to the immaterial, right, in our mind from our inner soul, we move to the immaterial. And so by doing so, we can comprehend God better. But this kind of gets into a very obvious question. God's essence is unknowable. So God is unknowable. Somehow we know about him. How does that work? Well, it's almost as if there has to be in God something distinct from his essence because his essence is completely unknowable, but 
something that is distinct from his essence in God leads us to know things about God. Does, is that, does that make any sense? So if everything is identical to the divine essence and the divine essence is utterly incomprehensible, then you can never know God, period. That's a big problem. You can't really escape that problem. That's a problem in eunomianism. This is why, again, eunomius, why does he say that we know God's essence? Well, if he said we didn't know God's essence, then for eunomius, there's no way you can ever know God because there are two ways you can know anything. It's kind of what they, what people in the 4th century epistemically agreed with. You can either know something, well, first of all, you know, we're talking about knowing conceptual things, right? You know, materially, you know, you can know them by sense experience, etc. But you can only know conceptual things in two manners. You either know their essence or you know uh, them by conceptions. Now, what is the basis of conceptions, right? We have, uh, you know, so we can use conceptions like door, way, vine, you know, these are names, ideas about, for example, Christ that we have in our mind that really describe has some relation. So, for example, um, the the shepherd, right? When when we say Christ is the good shepherd, what do we mean by that? Does that mean that he's really good with sheep? No, it means that we are his sheep. We follow him, and he fall, he guides us to heaven, right? He guides us to salvation in him. That's what it means for him to be a good shepherd. So, what did we just describe? certain activities about Christ in our salvation, right? So that's what conceptions refer to. And so these conceptions are connected with names. These names are connected with God's divine activities. And it is through these divine activities or energies we know God. Uh, in St. Gregory, the theologian, for example, elsewhere says that uh, God, God is one because there is a single Godhead or single divinity. Well, St. Gregory of Nyssa in On Not Three Gods says Godhead or divinity is an energy. So unless either St. Gregory Theology and St. Gregory of Nyssa contradict each other, which not even Roman Catholics will want to say something like that, or they are congruent with each other. But if they are congruent, then that means that God is one because he has one energy of divinity. Exactly. That's how God is one. God is one because Godness or divinity is one energy shared by three divine persons, essentially because they have the same essence. That's why there's one God. That's one of the other reasons why there's one God. There's many other reasons why there's one God. There's one God because there's the Father. There's one God because there's one essence. There's one God because they have one energy, right? They have a unity of operation, unity of activities. But if you have a unity of activities, then that means there is such a thing as activities. Right? I mean, it's, it's really that simple. Uh, and some people might ask, and this is, this is, a, this is a question that St. Gregory Theology responds to. Some people might argue, well, well, you're talking about distinctions here, right? You're talking about different things. How do they not create a composition or how do they not destroy the simplicity of God? So this gets to the question of how can God not be simple? You know, how can God not be separate? St. Gregory Theologian says, does he say that separation is a feature of distinctions? Absolutely not. You know what he says? He says separation is a feature of divisibility and composition. Now, divisibility and composition is a feature of the material world. Divisibility and composition is not a feature of the incorporeal, the utterly, you know, the, those whose nature is beyond corporeality. This is also St. Gregory Palamas's argument, by the way, but he gets that from St. Gregory the Theologian. So because God is beyond incorporeality, God cannot be divisible. Therefore, God is divinely simple. That's why God is divine, has divine simplicity. It's not because there are no distinctions, right? So that's why God doesn't have any parts, because he is beyond the idea of having parts. But is he beyond the idea of having distinctions? Well, if you believe in the Trinity, you know, God has distinctions, God has plurality. Even if you're a Muslim, you have to believe that God has plurality because you yourself will have to agree that there are eternal divine attributes that God has. But wait a second, if God has eternal divine attributes, doesn't that... So somehow you can believe in Tevhid, but then you can say that God is plural in some form. Yeah, 
that's why the Trinity is true, you know? Um, do you understand why the Trinity is not as contradictory to, you, to the idea of oneness? If the Trinity destroys oneness in God, then God has to be utterly one. So, okay, congratulations, you got Neoplatonism. Now, there are some Muslims that are, in fact, Neoplatonists. Uh, but those are mostly heretical Muslims, you know. Man, talking too much strains your strains your lips. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> kind of just repeating myself. But if you have questions you want to ask by super chat, you can send me a super chat and ask that question. If you want to support this channel financially as well, that's also a choice that you can make. Uh, and if you you know if you haven't liked or shared and subscribed already, do that. Anyways, let's move on. Uh, Yes, yeah, so that is lack of composition is not due to lack of distinction, but rather being incorporeal. Yes. Um, so, Sengiru theologian then goes into the existence of God. What? How do we know that God exists? What is his arguments for the existence of God? He says, how could this universe have had foundation or constitution unless God gave all things being and sustains them? No one seeing a beautifully elaborated lyre with his harmonious orderly arrangement and here... And hearing the lyre's music will fail to form a notion of its crafts, craftsman, player, to recur to him in thought, though ignorant of him by sight. So I will say that pretty much the basis of the argument here is many things in the world, and he kind of gets into kind of like the self-movement argument, right? So everything that is in the universe is moved, therefore it needs someone that moves itself, and unless otherwise there is infinite regress, but at the same time, Everything in this universe has has some form of contingency, right? It has some form of uh, necessity to something else aside from itself in order for it to have movement. Or in order for it to have really anything, right? Anything that we talk about, ethics, logic, morality. Uh, other than God, you really cannot justify any of these things. So in short, you can kind of define the argument in that direction. Uh and then he, yeah, unless there's a self-mover movement to love us and infinite regress, and the self-mover is God himself, and thus he is fully incorporeal. Uh, so because he's fully incorporeal, by the way, there's, there's degrees of incorporeality because the incorporeality of God and the incorporeality of the angels are not the same because God, for example, is omnipresent. The angels are not omnipresent, so they still occupy some form of incorporeal space to paradoxically... Uh, state this argument, whereas God is present everywhere, but God can specially manifest his presence in one point in time, for example. Does that mean that God becomes mutable by doing so? No. In fact, that's proof of his omnipresence. Otherwise, he can never be omnipresent. I mean, how stupid is that? Um, so some people apparently call this panentheism or weak panentheism. I don't bother with those kinds of stupid philosophical names. All I know is that God is beyond presence he's omnipresent he can specially manifest his presence at any space he wills according to his decision right according to his will that's all i know basically whether you want to call that panentheism or whatever i know that's not pantheism for example because we make a distinction between god's presence which is an activity and god's essence so that by definition cannot be pantheism for, for instance anyways uh, St. Gregory the Theologian, now he's speaking about negative, right, affirmations about what God isn't. But he says that there's also a necessity to affirm positive things about God. Well, how can we affirm positive things about God? Well, the, if the essence is fully incomprehensible, then it's kind of impossible to make positive statements in a way, you know. Some people argue from double negation, but there are some things that we can positively speak about God. For example, God is beyond existence. You know, that is a negative statement. But God also exists. So how is God beyond existence and how, we, how does he exist at the same time? Because he is beyond existence in his nature, but he has existence as an energy. And when we speak of energy, right, we, some, some of the energies, for example, relate to his will. So he wills it to be so. But some of them relate to his very character, right? So these divine attributes, or you want to call, if you want to call them, you can call them properties, 
or propria, I believe in Latin, um, especially if you read the transformation of divine simplicity, Galovitz makes this point, right? Some of the things about God that is distinct from his essence are called propria, and they kind of uh, describe the, the marks and the characters of God, right? So existence is a character of God, but in his essence, he's also beyond existence. Is that contradictory? No. Why? Because we're not saying that the essence is beyond existence and it exists at the same time. You're saying the essence is beyond existence, the energies exist, exist therefore God exists and is beyond existence. That is not saying that is not a paradox or a contradiction. I mean, it, maybe it's a paradox. It's not a contradiction because the same category is not being referred to in opposites, though beyond existence is not opposed to existence, right? This is why also being beyond logic, does that mean you are not logical? And in fact, verifies that you're logical in, in a way, right? It's just that the, the, mo the way in which you're logical, the way in which you exist is completely different the way in which we exist or which we uh, have a logical system of comprehension. Anyways, so he kind of gets into another argument. How is God not located in, in space? If he, if he's located in space, there are two ways that you can go. Either the universe contains God or God is above some area in the universe, above the universe, right? So it's outside the universe, you can say. If he's in the universe, then he cannot be the creator of the universe. It's actually not that difficult to figure out once you think about it. You know, he's within it. Before the creation of the universe, where is God, right? That's what the question is going to be. Um, so the universe will have to be eternal in that sense. Uh, but if the universe is eternal, then God, in order to be God, had to create the universe, to cause the universe. That doesn't make any sense, right? Or the universe has divine characteristics of its own apart from God. But if God is above the universe, he's outside the universe, like as if, you know, we're talking about outside the universe, it's still a space, right? Well, how do we know the existence of this, of this space? So this is the same argument I used against the multiverse theory. How are we going to know a different multiverse? I'm going to know that there is such a thing as a different multiverse, right? Uh, if you want a longer version, I can give it to you too. But it pretty much reduces itself to the first response. And we already saw how the first response is illogical. Uh, thus, we know that the essence of God, that God essentially is not someone that we can conceptually fully understand. If we did so, then God will be limited to one of the two options, basically. I wonder if you can hear the sound that I'm making from my chair. I want to test this. Hold up. All right. Seems like there's no sound, actually, because the mic's not, not being activated. That's kind of annoying me, but if you can't hear it, then that's fine. Um, yeah. So then he speaks about analogies and how analogies do come to a purpose, but at the same time, you know, they don't really fulfill the purpose that you want them to fulfill. So, for example, let's say we call God fire, right? God is fire. Well, if fire is how we're going to understand God, then we still need to rid ourselves of the ideas of corporeality. Fire is corporeal, right? It's material. So, we have to kind of understand that what part of fire, you know, what aspect of fire does actually correspond to God analogically and what actually does it. That's how that's the secret of understanding analogies. All of these analogies, although have similarities with God, they had dissimilarities. Now, many people, many pagans, did not notice the dissimilarities. That's why they ended up worshipping fire, they ended up worshipping elements, they ended up worshipping emotions, the stars, planets, uh, in, in objects in the world, because they understand that some of these things that are created have some sort of connection with God, some analogy with God, but they have some form of similarity with God. Wait a second, how can they have similarity too, right? Well, they can't have similarity in their essence. So there has to be something else that, there's, you know, if you say, you know, God exists, we are saying he's similar to us in that regard. We exist, God exists, right? So there is similarity there. And that similarity cannot be an essential similarity. It can't. Uh, but we can understand the dissimilarities and the similarities and how we should correctly understand them only through revelation. This is why 
You can never really fully understand God by philosophical speculation alone. You can use philosophy to prove the Trinitarian God. You can use philosophy to prove that Christianity is the true faith. You can actually do these things. But in order for you to be able to do that, you need revelation first. You need revealed theology first, and you need to understand it. You need to practice it. And then you can, you can use philosophy as a handmaiden of theology and use it to prove Christianity, for example, by showing that it is the only coherent worldview and the other worldviews, which really are can be reduced to you know different categories. All of these different worldviews can indeed be uh, refuted. Now, again, this stream is not going to be about that, but hopefully I'll be, maybe I'll be doing a video on that specifically. But uh, he then finalizes his oration with... Um, Oh, so he he then says, you know, that nothing in the world is by chance, right? Everything in the world has an order, direction, and purpose. There's no such thing as a chance, as a, as chance. So, you know, good luck is actually not a good thing to say because luck involves some sort of chaos. But everything in the world has direction by God. So there is really no such thing as luck. Yes, that means there is no such thing as RNG. Uh, there is no such thing as these things. It's kind of hard to conceptualize these things, but. Everything that is random actually still has direction and purpose. And uh, everything in life follows some form of divine order, right? So I'm not denying the fact, I'm not denying such a thing as something random, right? But even randomness, which seemingly is chaotic, actually has a purpose and an order to it. Um, I believe like pseudorandom, for example, right? So pseudorandom is, for example, um, pseudorandom is when, I believe there's like, let's say there's like a 10% chance that you like crit someone or like something happens, right? So like you do it the first time, it doesn't happen. But if you do it another time, so I think according to pseudorandom principles, the probability actually increases for like the, like it goes up to like, for example, 5%, right? So now it's 15%. Try it again, 20% now. So like there's true random, pseudo random. So even like that's an example as like uh, different orders of randomness, right? So, tr so it's true random will state that, you know, you try something, 10% chance, try it again, 10% chance again, 10% chance, 10% chance over and over again. Pseudo random is kind of, it increases to, um, I don't know exactly, but there are some games in fact that use a pseudo random. I know Dota 2 uses pseudo random. So people, uh, for example, if they want to crit someone, I think they like hit like neutral enemies like a couple of times and then they hit an enemy hero and like to increase like the chance of getting a crit. It's like kind of crazy, but that's, that's a bit of off topic. But it's off topic because that concludes the second theological oration, which was on God. So now we are on to the third theological oration, which is the oration on the sun. Oration 29. And let's see how everyone's going. Uh, oh, thank, Pano has made a $10 contribution, sir. Thank you for your service, sir. Can I, I cannot live in my summer home without your without your money, sir. Um, I'm just, I'm just kind of joking. But... Um, uh, but... Appreciate it. He says, to this point, in Greek, a common postscript you'll see in letters and emails is to your energies, which implies your character as reflected in your writing. Yes, yeah, so it's like to your working, right? Um, to your activities. And dang, someone is monopolizing the chat, but oh, I, I, that's cool. Uh, so now we are on to the third theological oration. Because it might be useful for someone reading the live chat, even though it's like, it's kind of crazy. But um, you might need some of them vitamins. I might need to do some scientific concoction stuff. Oh, David uses vitamins? Cringe! How dare you use vitamins, bro? can't ever do such a thing 
Ugh. You, 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 you're deciding to be healthy? Bro, be health, be an unhealthy freak like me. I'm fat and disgusting slob. I look amazing, though. Uh, nah, it's... It's actually been working for me. I mean, I've been sick for a long time now, like more than a week, maybe even two weeks now. But like every time I take like vitamins or like eat something that is like very clearly healthy, it's actually been pretty good for me. Like I remember when I first came back to Turkey, one of the first things I did is after eating is I took my my uh, vitamin supplements and felt good. They felt I felt really good. I did like freaking fifty push-ups afterwards while sick. Uh, so. It does work, right? It does work quite well. As a push up, it's like it's good to like. So there's some people do like you know like this, right? It's a theology stream, but we're talking about well, actually, working out is theological because by prayer we work out our soul, but working out works out our body, and it also instructs us to how to work out our soul. So in fact, it's actually theological. So men should work out. So this is actually a theological guide right something to help you so some people you know people like like when they're pushing up they like do this right like they do it, like bend it like that but um i recently found from like a video that you can like do like explosive right so like it's like this so um it, there's like a lot more force to it there's a lot more power and it works your chest whereas this kind of just like it like works more so like this area but if you do it like this, like push it like this, it works your chest. It's pretty useful. Anyways, very important workout tips that you're not going to get elsewhere in the theological channel. But let's let's move on to the third theological oration, right? We, okay, we had enough fun. We had enough of a break, right? Mental break. The third theological oration is the oration on the sun. Although although these or, this oration is on the sun, there's a lot of Trinitarian principles that St. Gregory, in fact, talked about. So... One of them is about the hypostatic properties of each person. Now, hypostatic properties are properties that, that is special to specifically that person which defines, or you can say describes, their very inner character, right? So, the God is the Father, right? So, how is what does the Father being the Father mean? Well, the Father describes the very inner character of the person of the Father. So first of all, we see a distinction between essence and person. Nature person, right? So a distinction between usia or physis, or if you want to talk, say it in English, substance, sub, substance, essence, uh, nature. A distinction between all of these things, you know, they're synonyms, right? And hypostasis or prosophon or person. Especially after Chalcedon, hypostasis and prosopon became synonyms. But um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so there's a distinction between the two. So there are properties that are proper to the essence, right? That God has. What are these essential properties that God has? Again, um, existence, right? Uh, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotency, goodness, right? God is love, right? Love is an essential property of God that all of the persons share. And since these persons all have the same essence, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all have the same essence, they all likewise have the same properties. Right? They all have the same divine properties. And by the way, when we say they all have these divine properties, do we mean that there's the, the you know there's a love of the Father and a love of the Son and a love of the Holy Spirit that is separate from each other? Absolutely not. That's wrong. That's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because there is no separation in the Trinity again, because they're fully incorporeal. And so the love of the Father is the love of the Son, is the love of the Holy Spirit. Right? It's the same love. Right? So when we speak of these natural properties, they're all of each other's well, primarily speaking, they're all the Father's divine property that the Son and the Spirit share naturally. So it's very important to make the distinction of sharing naturally and sharing like human beings. Right? We share some things like theosis, right? Uh, we share in God's divine properties true grace. Is that how Christ has divine properties in himself? No. In fact, in letters in his first letter to Cladonius, one of the anathema, anathemas is that very idea. Is that Christ is not divine by grace. Christ is divine by nature. So there's 
sharing my nature and then sharing by grace. Sharing by grace implies that your nature does not have that naturally. So you don't naturally have that property. You're given it. It is given to you. But if it's shared to you by nature, it is something that is in your very character, right? So the essential characteristics of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same, but the hypostatic characteristics, the personal characteristics that define the very inner character of each of the persons, that is specific to that very person. According to St. Gregory the Theologian, the very inner characteristic, the hypostatic property of the Father is ingenerate or unbegotten, whatever you want to say. The hypostatic characteristic, hypostatic property of the Son is being begotten. And the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is proceeding dot, 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 from the Father. He quotes John 15, 26 for this. He says, proceeding from the Father is the hypostatic characteristic of the Holy Spirit. Again, the, you know, uh, uh, St. Gregory Theologian is a saint for the Roman Catholic Church. He's a saint for the Oriental Orthodox. But in this example, with relation to Roman Catholics, that's a contradiction to Roman Catholic dogma. The hypostatic pr property of the Holy Spirit is not only proceeding from the Father according to Roman Catholic theology. But wait a second. Who were the ones that really made the creed in the Second Ecumenical Council? Who were the ones responsible? Who were the responsible for that idea? The guy we are making a video of. That guy, St. Gregory Theologian. That guy. He is the one. He is, the, he is one of the godfathers of the Nikin Constantinopolitan Creed. And what does it say in the creed? The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, but he is worshipped together with the Father and the Son. Uh oh, there's a distinction here. So the Holy Spirit shares in the life of the Father and the Son, essentially, because they're, he's, he's just as divine as they are, right? He has the same nature. So he's worshipped together with them. So he has the same nature. And so he has natural affinity with the Son. That is why he's also the Spirit of Christ. But... He is the Spirit of God, not only essentially, but He's the Spirit of God hypostatically. How? Because He proceeds from the Father alone. And this idea is very central. And this is not just the only proof. This idea is very central to St. Gregory the Theologian's Trinitarian theology. Now, this isn't about the fully... In fact, I do plan to make a fully stream, but... So I'm, I'll elaborate more there, but there are many other statements um, in his orations. I believe the 31st oration is one of those statements where he says, the, the Son has everything from the Father except for causality. Why? Because causality characterizes the person of the Father. It is not something that he can share with the Son. What will happen if he could share it with the Son? St. Photius the Great says, that will turn the Son into a Father Son. It will make the Son composite. So now suddenly... The Son cannot even be properly distinguished from the Father. He now shares a personal characteristic of the Father that is by definition is not shareable. You can't, the Father does not share being cause. If you could share being cause, then there's more than one cause in the Trinity. Now you can say, Father and the Son together are one cause. Why? First of all, does, does the Father need the Son to be caused with Him? That's another argument from St. Photius. Does the Father need the Son to be caused with Him? I mean, the Father caused the Son. The Father is the sole cause of the Son. He didn't need anyone else to cause the Son. So why does He need the Son to cause the Holy Spirit now? Right? Now you might say, oh, but, but He causes because the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. But wait a second. Now you're confusing the personal hypostatic life of the Father with the energetic love of the Father and the Son. Those are actually two different things, two different processions. St. Gregory Palamas says, in fact, he adopts the Augustinian argument of the Holy Spirit being the love between the Father and the Son. He says, St. Augustine is right about this analogy. He says, you're the ones that are wrong about this analogy. Why? Because the Holy Spirit manifests that energy of love in his hypostasis between the Father and the Son. That is not a hypostatic procession. That's an energetic, eternal procession. That is about the inner life of the Trinity. And then there's the economic procession of the Holy Spirit where he is sent from the Father through the Son. 
and the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father through the Son to creation. And the divine energy of grace, for example, in the Holy Spirit is sent to us, to creation. St. Gregory Thaumaturgus, in fact, says uh, something very, very close to this. Let me, let me find this quote that I'm referring to. St. Gregory Thaumaturgus is also known as St. Gregory the Wonderworker. In his Confession of Faith, which is recorded by St. Gregory of Nyssa, he says, One Holy Spirit holding existence from God and manifested through the Son, namely to human beings. That's economic procession. Now, some people say, no, that's St. Gregory of Nyssa. That's not St. Gregory the Wonderworker. Doesn't matter to me, because they're both saints. So if that's St. Gregory of Nyssa, that still proves our point, right? That there is a distinction between hypostatic procession, economic procession, and eternal energetic procession. Three very different things. Anyways, that's enough about the philosophy for the time being. Now let's uh, talk about the three main views, the worldviews, that St. Gregory analyzes. Anarchy, democracy, and monarchy. But although this is kind of like a political commentary as well, some people say it's not a political argument or anything like that. And it is not. It is actually a theological argument he's making. So when he says anarchy, he's talking about atheism. When he says democracy, he's talking about polytheism. And when he says monarchy, he talks about monotheism. But when he says monotheism, does he speak about a generic one god monotheism? No, because that will include Neoplatonism too. But St. Gregory Theologian doesn't have any love for Neoplatonism. St. Gregory Theologian is talking about monarchy in the sense of the Trinity. Wait, how is there monarchy in the Trinity? Because there's one God, the Father, and the Father is the very basis of the Trinity. He is the, his hypostasis is the basis of the union of the divine persons in the Trinity. Right? This is why we have many statements from the Son where he, for example, says, the Father is greater than I am. We're going to be analyzing that statement too, but um, that refers to cause. The Father caused the Son. So in that sense, in, in terms of hypostasis, he is greater than him. But, for example, a king is greater than his subjects. But does that mean that the king is of a different substance than his subjects? Well, that's ridiculous, right? It's the same idea. The Father is the king of not only all creation, but even of the Trinity. He's the very monarch of the Trinity. So there are three different worldviews. Atheism, polytheism, and monotheism. Now, atheism and polytheism, in fact, are really not different. They're the same thing because they don't have a governance single, single unifying governing principle. But monarchy has a single unifying governing principle. And this is another thing, you know, Muslims, you have to actually think about this. If you're honest with yourselves, you got to look at yourself. How is it that Trinitarians are telling pagans that they should be believing in monarchy? Because St. Gregory the Theologian is not a Unitarian. He, he doesn't believe in the same God as you do. And yet he strongly argues that there's monarchy. In, is he contradicting himself so blatantly and obviously? Or is it because there is a principle of union in the Trinity compared to the rest of creation? There is, in fact. In fact, Trinity is really closer to genuine Tawheed than your idea of Tawheed because your idea of Tawheed is based on dialectical opposition between unity and plurality. Ours isn't. We unify these two things together. So there is a harmony of monad and the triad. In fact, the triad is the harmony of the one and the three, of the one and the many. And so, in a sense, the one and the many is made one. <laughs> Right? Paradoxically speaking. But that doesn't mean that the one has power over the many. In fact, the very basis of reality is the balance of these two principles together. That is why, for example, there are many things in creation that has unity, that is oneness, but it's also plural at the same time. You can think of it, for example, the abstract account of universal in particular. There is only one universal man, right? Human nature, but there are many particular human persons. How are they both unified? St. Gregory Palama says that the universal of human nature exists in each of its particulars. Oh, Palamite stuff, right? Wrong. You know, St. Gregory Palama, you know who, this, who he gets this from? He gets it, for example, in the 6th century, John the Grammarian makes the same exact argument. The Antis of Jerusalem makes the same exact argument. Uh, 
and the Cappadocians really implicitly make the same exact argument. Uh, they're not tritheistic. So there is a unity of, in, in essence, will, power, and mind in God, but there's a distinction of persons. And so the principle of monarchy is based on the person of the Father because it is the Father's essence. It is the Father's will, the will of the Father, Christ says in scriptures. This is the power of Father, it's the mind of the Father that the three divine persons naturally share. Dang. All right. <clears throat> I'm just... Hello, Father Deacon Ananias. Just noticed you. Uh, glad you're enjoying the stream, Father. I hope you like it. Uh, now, listening while working out right now. Yeah, work out that body, bro. Uh, <clears throat> let's move on. So, now, having said that, now how do we understand the Son and the Holy Spirit existing? In what manner does the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Father exist, right? Modes in which they exist. So, for example, we say that the Son is eternally generated. The Spirit, Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father. But how do we understand this? How do we explain this? Well, secondary theologian, for, first of all, says you can't ever understand this thing. Why? Because when we speak of generation, we always think of it again in temporal terms. But what we're talking about is that it is a um, incorporeal manner of generation. And uh, when we also speak of temporality, for example, when we say, my father beget me, well, this implies that my father is older than I am, right? Because we are both subject to time. So we are both originate. But God is unoriginate. God is unoriginate with relation to time and space. God does not have any origin. Now, uh, so because God is unoriginate in time and space, when we speak of the father begetting the son, we don't actually say because they are both before time. This beginning is before time. In fact, even saying before time implies there is time before time, right? So we can never really understand what the divine, I suppose, realm, to kind of, you know, analogically use the term realm, was like before time. We really can't understand. It's beyond time. It's something that's beyond time. So this generation does not imply that the Father was prior to the Son. They are both eternal. But... Wait a second, David, you told me that God is unoriginate, but now you're saying the, the Son and the Holy Spirit have their origin in the Father. Yes, God is unoriginate with respect to time and creation, but they are. But the, the Son and the Holy Spirit are originate, in, hypostatically speaking. So, <clears throat> does that mean that the essence is unoriginate? Well, it's two senses of the term origin and unoriginate, right? So, the sense in which unoriginate that applies to all of the three persons is that they're not created, they're not subject to time, they're not subject to space. So it is kind of just saying they're uncreated, right? So in that manner, they are unoriginated, but they have their origin in the person of the Father. They're still not created, they're still not subject to time and space, but that is the manner of which their origin is. And so it is not right to just say, oh, you know, you call the Son the Holy Spirit originate, that means they are um, they are created, not necessarily. If you define very precisely what originate means in that context. And St. Gregory the Theologian, by the way, he's the one saying this. Not me, I'm not the one saying that. St. Gregory the Theologian saying this in this oration. So being unoriginate implies eternality, but eternality doesn't imply being unoriginate. Origination that we know of is a temporal reality that is dependent on time. And in a, in a great analogy that, that St. Gregory uses, because some might still be belligerent. Some might still say, David, this doesn't make any sense. Look, you have to, you have to be honest. You know, you say the father beget the son. That means the father is temporally prior to the son. That implies temporality of the son. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the son, for example. Is the light of the son after the establishment of the sun, the effects of the sun, is that after the establishment of the sun? So, was the sun made and then the sun produced light? No, right? No. We cannot even conceive of the sun without the light that it pr produces. 
So although the light that the sun emits and the sun itself are both distinct, they're two different things. We cannot think of them in separation. So if we can apply this logic to the sun, then why do you not apply the same logic to God? It will be contradictory to not do so. Therefore, it is indeed possible for God to beget, to have a son in this regard, and for God to have a Holy Spirit proceed from him. The begetting does not imply change, because what is being begotten is not a corporeal body, it is an incorporeal reality. Um, and so, different creations have different modes of begetting. So, for example, the way in which a, a tree is begotten, right? a tree is generated from another like a tree seed or, or whatever, you know, that's the mode in which it is generated. The mode in which human beings are generated are different from that. And the mode in which God begets his son is obviously going to be different. So it's not going to be like, so some people say, well, if God is begot, if God has a son, where the wife? Uh, 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 I'm dumb. If God has a son, where the wife? Uh, if, if a tree can generate another tree, where is the mother tree? <laughs> That's how stupid you sound. Where, where's the mother tree? Did they have sex with the mother tree? No. It's a different creation. It's a different nature. So it has a different mode of generating. So God has a different mode of generating. Obviously, duh. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. All right? It sounds It sounds funny. It sounds cool. It sounds like, oh, God does do with the mother, with the mother, dude, with the wife. And the fact that this is in the Quran... Bro, like, seriously, that's the best argument you have? Your God, that's the best argument your God has? Give me a break, bro. You're a joke. Your religion is a joke, all right? You're a joke. Seriously, you're a joke. If you actually believe this, like, argument is a good argument. Each different nature has a different, like, or, or, or think of, like, a torch. Let's say there's a torch with an eternal fire. This is an analogy St. Gregory of Nyssa used, right? The analogy of the three tor torches. Let's say there's a torch. This fire is ever burning. Well, actually, it doesn't matter if it's ever burning. Like, let's say you have a, just a normal torch. And then we have another torch. There's no fire. Now there's fire. Oh, uh, if the torch generate, if the fire from the torch generated fire on another torch, where's the mother torch? Uh -huh. Where's the mother torch? Zero IQ, right? Zero IQ arguments. But what, is, what do we believe? The Father generated the Son according to the power of His nature, right? So begetting the Son does not mean that He had a vibe and did something with that. But He has a Son because He has an affiliation with His Son. There is a special affiliation by nature that the Father has with His Son. Now... Before I get to the other explanation about like the Holy Spirit proceeding, uh, I want to, I want to first. Well, may, let's let's get to the let's get to the fluidic argument first because Saint Gregory says that we come from a pair, right? So we come from a mother and a father, because we come from a mother and a father, we are composite for that reason, right? Um, so, and he's not referring to body and soul here. He's referring to two causes. We have two causes in our existence, a father and mother, right? Uh, even though we've begun from our father. Now, isn't that interesting? Why are we composite? Why are we divisible? Because we come from two causes. But if the Holy Spirit came from two causes, what does that make the Holy Spirit? It makes it composite too. And by the way, guess who makes this argument? Saint Photius makes this argument in his mystical. He's just repeating Saint Gregory the Theologian here. Four centuries later. All right. He's just using that same principle that Saint Gregory the Theologian uses. Now, uh, to kind of get back to the Trinity and begetting and and uh and, and all of the uh, all of this stuff. The Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds. Right? So the Son is begotten. But there's a distinction between the Son being begotten and the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father. How do we know that this distinction? How do we know that there is a distinction? A singular theologian says, we don't know this distinction. Why do we not know this distinction? We don't know this distinction because we don't even know the idea of divine begetting and divine proceeding is. 
But we know from Revelation that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son is begotten from the Father. Now, someone might ask, well, can't God also generate other persons in different ways? No, why? Well, we actually have from Revelation the answer to that. And if you watched my Genesis commentary videos, I give the answer there. Man is made in the image of God. Man exists in three different modes. Unbegotten, that is Adam. And begotten, that is Seth and the rest of the human family. And very few people think about this. But Eve proceeds from Adam's rib. He, she proceeds from the rib of Adam. Adam still has his rib. But she proceeds from Adam's nature. That is a di but Eve is not a son of Adam or a daughter of Adam. Eve is a separate person that does not have, she's not a relative of Adam in that regard, right? In this same regard, like a brother or sister is, right? So, a man is made in the image of God. So, no, no, wait a second, wait a second. Adam is unbegotten. Adam is the father of all human beings. Seth and the rest of Adam's progeny were all begotten. And then there's Eve that proceeds from Adam. So wait a second. Unbegotten, begotten, proceeding. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, God is like that too. In fact, God has revealed to us in the Old Testament that he exists in that manner. In the Old Testament, this was revealed. This is not in the New Testament. This is in the Old Testament. Man is made in the image of God. The way, the modes in which man exists, these hypostatic properties are similar to the hypostatic properties of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So, even human beings can proceed from another human being without being a relative of that human being. And, in fact, um, to get back to the begetting thing, let's not forget, uh, God says to Adam, be fruitful and multiply before the fall. Well, before the fall, there is no sexual relation. So, how could they be fruitful and multiply? Well, God, will, God knows different ways to multiply the human family but let us consider again there's two ways to understand begetting number one is by the you know earthly you know sexual way of understanding begetting right that is you know that is what we undergo through this is due to original sin but there is a sinless way to understand begetting and that is by affiliation right that's kind of how uh Galavitz describes it right Begetting by affiliation. And so this affiliation was still possible before the fall. So Adam still had the power to beget before the fall. It is just that the manner of begetting another human person has become corrupted with sin. That's why we are begetting in this matter, manner from now on. Uh, so I believe that should cover... Yeah, uh, also important details. St. Gregory the Theologian used the term Theotokos. So... He believes virgin is, uh, the Virgin Mary is the mother of God. Uh, which is very natural. I mean, Scripture says she's the mother of my Lord. So, Lord is a divine title. So, from that to mother of God is really not a big jump. Ah, very nice to drink some industrial oil, seed oils. Google seed oils, so you'll, you'll understand what I mean. Very tasty stuff. Totally does not cause cancer and, and other unhealthy um, sicknesses. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so now, there's another question from Eunomians, which is, so it's about voluntary stuff right so is god the father voluntarily so did god voluntarily beget his son right now saint Gary, the theologian used the analogy of for example fathers you know they voluntarily have children but that power to to beget someone is still it's not a power according to their will right they don't you know they don't just uh, say i'm gonna work like from my hand and uh, I'm going to do dong, 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 and I'm going to work a new building, right? That's external to me. No, St. Athanasius says doing that is something external to you. But, it, but the power of that nature was used in order to generate another human being. 
Uh, now, I think a better way to kind of understand this, especially today, um, because of the kind of advancements of theological terms, is that really the question of voluntary, involuntary, etc. These are questions that really refer to the will of God. So, whether God willingly did something, or whether God willed to do something because of necessity, that is really the real question. So, uh, for example, did God freely will to create? If you believe that there's a distinction between God's essence and energies, then yes. Why? Because God is, he always has the capacity to create in his, in his power, but he act, actualizes it at a specific point in time. He actualizes creation, you know, creating the, the earth at a specific point in time. Uh, but if God, if God's energy is the same as his essence, and if God is creator, then God eternally has to be creator, right? Otherwise, you're saying that uh, you're making distinctions about God by saying he has the capacity to create, but he, you know, actualized it, you know, that goes against actus purus, that goes against pure act ideas. Uh, but then God has to eternally create. So God involuntarily creates in order to be God. So, what we're talking about here is about the very character of the person of the Father, right? The questions about voluntarily doing something or involuntarily doing something, in terms of the character of a person, is not really... A, so, for example, um, you know, there are certain things about me as a person. And I'm not even talking about personality, but like just things about me as a person, the way I think, the way I... Um, you know, manifest things about myself. Or, you know, if I do good things by God's grace, the way I manifest that goodness in my... ...different way compared to I do. You know, or uniqueness characterizes the very inner being of our persons. Now, can we just will to just change who we are as a person? No, right? Uh, that question is beyond voluntarily doing it and involuntarily doing it. That is just who you are as a person. The father is who he is as a father. The being father characterizes him as a person. The son, likewise, is characterized as being the son of the father. The Holy Spirit is characterized as the spirit who proceeds from the father. So it is their very personhood that is, that is being characterized here. And so... We must not confuse these two things. Voluntary, involuntary. These questions relate to whether God can act or not, or whether if God acts in this way, does he have to act in this way, or can he freely act in that way? That is what is really the question here. And, and so the, the father is not father by an activity, but he is a father by his very inner character that generates another person, the son. Uh, and hypostatic characteristic stuff. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, another argument that Eunomians use is that the son's begetting cannot be eternal, right? Eternal generation cannot be eternal because that will mean that the son is eternally incomplete. But So it must have an end, but whatever has an end must have a beginning, therefore the son has a beginning. But if this principle is contradictory on its own because angels and souls have a beginning, but they don't cease to exist. Right, and the presupposition of that: oh, if he's eternally being generated, then he's eternally incomplete. No, it is just that his generation is beyond time. So that can really easily be answered. Um, if he, ah, Saint Gregory the theologian says, if we say that the Father is qua cause superior to the Son, they add the minor premise, but he is caused by nature, and hence conclude that he is greater by nature. But the superiority is not on the level of nature. And being cause, again, is a personal property that describes the mode in which that thing exists. Right? So, um, again, the Son being begotten describes the mode in which the divine nature exists in the person of the Son. The Father being unbegotten is the same, same exact way. It's the mode in which the divine nature exists in the person of the Father. So the father is caused, but causality in this regard does not, it is not referring to generating, it's not referring to creation. Because creation 
is something that comes from the will. And so it is external. It's some, it creates something external to its creator. Generating is something that is internal to that creature because uh, it is generating. Generation is the power of nature to generate another nature. As St. Kirill of Alexander says, the power of nature is to generate another nature. The power of energy um, is to create. Therefore, nature and energy in God are not equal. They're not identical. This is St. Kirill of Alexandria in Thesaurus 18. Oh, taste the seed oils. So, there's an argu another argument by Eunomians. The name Father Eden refers to nature or energy. No, it doesn't. It refers to the relation, which is hypostatic. Right? So, it refers to the person of the Father. St. Gregory the Theologian then says, Man and God blended. They became a single whole, the stronger side predominating in order that I might be made God to the same extent that he was made man. So this is clearly referring to theosis here. God became man so that man might become God. How does man become God? Well, God is, how is, you know, how is God God? He's God by nature. How does man become God? By nature? No, that's Mormonism. God be, a man becomes God by grace, right? So it is by grace that we participate in God's divinity. Uh, now, the term blended, in fact, has the connotations of mixture, right? It seems like, wait, St. Gregory is saying that Christ mixed, but St. Gregory at the same time says that the two natures after the union existed without losing their natural characteristics. How is that even possible? Now, the reason why the Council of Chalcedon rejected um, the terminology of mixture is because mixture also implied you know, the, the loss of na the natural characteristics of those two natures. So if Christ became man and but lost his divinity, well, that's mixture, right? For example, or that, or maybe man and God mixed together and there became like a middle third thing, a tertium quid that is neither of those two things that it's mixed out of. So when St. Gregory the Theologian speaks of mixture, and this he was kind of grilled on this by some people, he, he explains what he means by mixture and what he says by mixture is that the natures of christ they did not cease becoming what they are but rather they are mixed because they are interpenetrate each other so he's referring to communicatio idiomatum uh, the, ec the exchange of properties which today we will say the exchange of energies so the divine energies of god deified the human nature of christ so Christ's human nature was completely deified as a result of this union. But not only Christ, but also the entirety of the human race or nature was restored and deified. And this full restoration can only be achieved by participating in the life of the church, by participating in the sacraments. Sacraments fully actualized or restoration. Baptism is one of them. Eucharist, right? Any sacrament. What does sacrament mean? means calling on the Holy Spirit, right? Any activity in the church that calls on the Holy Spirit. So there are seven sacraments, but there's also more than seven sacraments. There's also less than seven sacraments. How? Different sense of the word sacrament. The general broad understanding of the term sacrament is calling on the Holy Spirit. Now, we use the term seven sacraments today in our catechisms because it is kind of the most commonly accepted understanding of the word sacraments. But there is, again, there is a very nuanced understanding of sacraments. So some people apparently kind of have a problem with that. Really, you know, saying that there are more sacraments than seven or less than seven actually does not deny the seven. <laughs> sounds paradoxical, it sounds strange. But when we say that, you know, the marriage, Eucharist, all of these things are still sacraments. You still call on the Holy Spirit in the sacraments. Um, but... Uh, I forgot to use, what, what example was it? I think it was monastic tonsure someone used. That's also another sacrament. But someone argued, no, because that's baptism. That's connected with baptism. It's like, no, it's like, not, not in the same sense, no. But I might be, I might be confused. Anyway, we're not talking about sacraments here in this video. Um, so man and God blended so that man might become God. Just like God became man. Uh, he then refers to both 
you know, or then he kind of ends the chapter, and I can I can show you the words, but he he talks about a bunch of names and what they mean in scripture, and these are like both human and divine names that are attributable to Christ to show that he's both man and both God. So this concludes the third theological oration, and it's been more than one and a half hours, going strong. This is a this is a pretty heavy, uh, more one of the videos that goes on the heavier side, but I. I've been enjoying my time first. I hope you've been learning. Hope you've been enjoying um, what we're doing here. Again, if you want to support the channel, if you want to financially support me, not even financially, but if you want to like, share this, subscribe this to see more, that will be great. And I will definitely recommend that. Uh, then before we look at the fourth theological oration, which is again, it is another or is the second oration on the sun. So oration 30. Uh, I believe this is the oration where a lot of scriptural passages are used. So a lot of like scriptural arguments are used against the idea of the Son being divine. So he's responding to these arguments. So this is the fourth theological oration is definitely the oration I will recommend anti-Trinitarians to listen to. Okay, because this is going to be very important. We're not going to be using mean Protestant arguments. Okay, we're not going to be saying anything like like Dr. Craig who says, "Oh, well, you see." Okay, yeah, that's that word seems to imply that the Son is not God, but if you read the rest of the Bible, it's like, you know, there's other passages. It's like, yeah, but got to be a bit stronger than that, right? In fact, some of these verses that seem to imply that the Son is created, you know, like that the Son is not God, etc. In fact, they say the they say the opposite. In fact, they actually they're actually proofs of the Son's divinity. Um, so mm. all right, it seems like all right, um, all right, it seems like we can move on to oration 30. It seems like chat's still going on, no questions asked. Or uh, the fourth theological oration. Let's go. Wait, my notes kind of. All right. So, first biblical argument. Proverbs 8, 22. The Lord created me as the beginning of his ways for his works. The argument is very obvious if you can read the verse. The argument means that the sun was created. It says, look, Proverbs is about wisdom. It's about the sun. You guys say it's about the sun. And it says that the Lord created me as the beginning of his way for his works. It, and so, doesn't this mean that the Son was created, the first creation of God? Right? First of all, if you're a Muslim, you don't want to accept this. Because uh, that will mean, first of all, that will pretty much go against uh, the very idea of, uh, I mean, I thought J Jesus was just a man, but it seems like he's kind of more than a man. So this is kind of like a, just an Aryan idea, because Aryans, and it's kind of funny seeing the Muslims, you know, they um, they make arguments like, oh man, uh, you, uh, I, I forgot what I was going to say, that's horrible, that's embarrassing, but um, I'll probably remember, probably remember, but to get back on what I was talking about here. So Proverbs 8.22. How do we respond to this? Right? The Lord created me as the beginning of the service for works. Well, go down three verses and you'll see what the response is. Uh, Proverbs 8.25. Before the mountains were settled and before all hills, that is, before creation, he begets me. Before creation, he begets me. Proverbs 8.25. So, the son is begotten, but then he's created as the beginning of his works. What does that mean? Proverbs 8.22 refers to the human nature of Christ. And the, the beginning of God's works refers to the works of salvation through the incarnation. So, uh, the specific work that is a beginning of God is the work of the incarnation, the salvation coming through that incarnation. And before that happened, Proverbs 8.25 says, Before that happened, I was begotten. Before that, I was begotten. So, in fact, Proverbs 8.25 is a Diophysite proof text. So, yes, I'm sorry, Orientals, but this refutes you. Because St. Gregory Theologian says that he was 
he was begotten in his divinity, but he was created in his humanity, in his divine nature and human nature, right? Uh, so Proverbs eight twenty three refers to humanity of the Son. By the way, you know what what you know means responded to this argument with. They will say, wait, so you're saying that we can say the Son is created according to his human nature, but he's uncreated in his divine nature. That means there are two persons. The Eunomians will argue that way. So, um, a, as a response to those people who respond with Proverbs 8.25. Uh, some, now he responds to the until argument. Now, usually you see the until argument, right? So, for example, it says that uh, the, the Mary, Mary was virgin until blah, 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 or something like that. So I forgot the exact words. Um, but... Guess what? You know, I mean, use that argument to say, you know, uh, there are certain passages in Scripture that says that Christ has divine-like authority until a certain point, right? Um, but until doesn't, in fact, refer to the end, right? So if you say Matthew twenty-eight twenty, I shall be with you till the end of the world. So he he asks, so is it going to stop being with us when the world ends? Well, even in your understanding, that doesn't make any sense, right? It should be with you until the end of the world. No, he's still going to be with us after the end of the world. It is just that, uh, for in this instance, maybe the way he's going to be with us after the end of the world is going to be in a different manner, right? So the same kind of argument goes for the Virgin Mary, right? It's a until argument. Until does not imply that that state has finished at that time. In fact, it refers to that state being that way to that time. It doesn't necessarily refer to anything afterwards. What happens afterwards, that's ambiguous, right? It can refer to, you know, you know it stopped afterwards, but it also cannot, right? It, it also might refer to its continuing, for example. So it's not really a good argument. Um, he quotes Psalm 82, 1, God stands in the midst of the gods, and it says God's referred to the saved. Uh, then quotes John 14, 2, where God has many mansions for the saved to reside in. And I, I kind of note here that I think this looks uh, opposed to the idea of soul sleep. Um, as if, you know, after we are saved, we are some, somehow, we just our soul is resting and we can't do anything. That's usually uh, that the soul sleep argument, especially these days by Protestants, is only adopted because uh, they want to find an excuse to reject uh, the the communion of the saints, right? They want to they want to reject the idea that saints can pray for us after the death. That's which is ludicrous. You know, God is not the God of the dead; He's the God of the living, um, and He's still the God of those, and He's the God who stands in the midst of the gods. That is, God, He stands in the midst of the saved, and then He talks about. The my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we, this is a very overused argument, and this is one like the, like first of all, there's Psalm 22. He's quoting from Psalm 22. That's what Psalm 22 starts with: "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" And secular theologian refers to that. But he says 21st Psalm because he's using the Septuagint. Uh, but secular theologian explains the meaning of "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" He says that God makes or submission his own. So he appropriates it. Now, appropriation means that he is that Christ is taking on a condition that is not naturally his. You understand? So when Christ is appropriating the, con the condition of us in the crucifixion, because he's, he's, he's you know, on, the on his deathbed in the crucifixion, He's appropriating our condition of the fear of death and the feeling of abandonment. Does that mean, St. Gregory Theologian says, does that mean he was abandoned by God according to his divinity, right? Which is the, the modern idea that a lot of Protestants have, that the father damned the son. St. Gregory Theologian says that's unacceptable. To, to, to read the full quote, he says, it is thus it is that he affects our submission, makes it his own, and presents it to God. My God, my God, look upon me, why have you forsaken me? Seems to me to have the same kind of meaning. 
He is not forsaken either by the Father or, as some think, by his own Godhead, which shrank in fear from suffering, abandoning the sufferer. Who applies that argument either to his birth in this world in the first place or to his ascent of the cross? No, in himself, as I have said, he expresses our condition. We had once been the forsaken and disregarded, then we were accepted and now are saved by the sufferings of the impassable. He made our thoughtlessness and waywardness his own, just as the psalm in his subsequent courses, since the 21st psalm clearly refers to Christ. So, which, by the way, Psalm 22, 16, or, you know, the 21st psalm, so Psalm 22, 16, uh, refers to the crucifixion very, very explicitly. Um, they had me by my hands and my feet. Well, that's one of the things that it says, but... Um, why, some might say, well, why did Christ take on that? Why did he even say that? Why did he even take on that condition? Because he wants to deify every positive aspect of humanity. And so he lived that humanity, the, the human, humanity of ours without sin. And that is one of the things that he appropriated in order to deify that very condition as well. And so now, although we fear death, because death is the enemy, we do not fear it anymore because death was defeated on the cross because Christ took on death on his, in his body and condemned it and casted it out to hell. Sent it to hell where it belongs. And so he has defeated death by the manner of death. You know, in the Lenten Triodion, this very theme of the times that we're living in right now is defeating death by death. And so he lived, on, lived that life in his own person. The son takes on the form of a man, and so in this form he is obedient. In the form of a slave, he says, but as the form of a slave, he comes down to the same level as his fellow slaves, receiving an alien form, he bears the whole of me. That is, form meaning nature, along with all that is mine in himself, so that he may consume within himself the meaner element, as fire consumes wax or the sun ground mist, and so that I may share what is his through the intermingling. So what is he trying to say here? He is saying that Christ took on human nature in himself, deified human nature, engulfed it with his divinity, so that we as persons, by participating in the person of Christ, in our nature, might also participate in his divine energies that is naturally communicated to our nature, because Christ took on our human nature and deified, restored and saved it. And this is the soteriological principle he uses against Cladonius, no, not Cladonius, Apollinarius, in his letter to Cladonius, where he says, Apollinarius is, is an idiot, he's mindless, because he rejects the salvation of the mind. The mind is not saved because it is not assumed. So, And what is not assumed is not saved. Now he talks about John 14, 28. Oh, the darling quote of all of these people, the Father is greater than I. And John 20, 17, my God and your God. Uh-oh. Oh, you Christians, you got on. Oh, one Bible verse has destroyed you. God, Christ says, the Father is greater than I. How can God be greater than God? And he even says, my God and your God. And he first of all, he responds to Philippians 2, 6 by saying, well, Scripture also elsewhere says God, uh, Christ is equal. So in a sense, Christ is equal to the Father. But in a sense, the Father is greater than Christ. What does that mean? Well, in naturally speaking, by nature, because they share the same nature, they are equal by nature. But the Father generates Christ. Christ is generated from the Father. God, uh, the Father causes Christ. Right? That is the manner in which Christ exists, being begotten from the Father. In that manner, Christ is lesser than the Father by person, by hierarchical rank. Now, when we speak of that rank, this rank is not natural. So, that it, so natural meaning that it is not by nature that the Father is higher than Christ. How is that possible? Because nature and person are distinct. That is why it's possible. Um, and my God and your God, yeah, so God is superior to his Son by cause, but equal to him by nature. And again, I used, the, I used the example prior. I mean, you have a king and his subjects. A king is superior to his subjects, but he is still equal to his subjects because they have the same nature. So there's, in fact, nothing controversial. In fact, you can use this John 14, 8, 28 argument. You can also say, well, this applies to his humanity. So uh, the Father is greater than Christ in his humanity. Yeah, it's not controversial. The divine nature is 
greater than the human nature. So the argument falls flat on his face. Um, and, you know, my God and your God, it's kind of the same principle. Even in his divinity, Christ's God is the Father because the Father is the cause of Christ. Again, that's not controversial once you understand eternal generation. Now, if you're like these Protestants that deny eternal generation, which these days it is actually quite popular to deny eternal generation. I don't know why, but it's very popular to deny eternal generation, to deny, to deny begetting and proceeding. You know, if you're a Protestant and you deny eternal generation, you can't answer these biblical passages. It's impossible for you to answer these biblical passages. So thank you, you know what I mean? You have actually proved orthodoxy by making these arguments against us. Because we don't run into this problem. The Protestants do. Even Roman Catholics, in a sense, do. Because imagine saying that the, the Son, you know, is caused by the Father, but they still share equal nature. But I thought person and nature are identical. Aren't they the same thing? Suddenly it isn't when you don't want it to be. Oh, but no, we are the heretics, right? We are the ones who are the big bad Palamite heretics, right? We are the stupid ones, not you, of course. So really, these arguments, in fact, prove the orthodox position exclusively. It proves that the orthodox understanding of the, the superiority of the Father to the Son is understood that does not contradict the equality between the Father and the Son. So there is equality and still a hierarchical ordering. There's balance. Again, one and many. There's no dialectics between them. It's not dialectical. Um, this is kind of, the, these understandings is why, for example, when you say that uh, men should be in hierarchy higher than women, all people think that you're saying then that women are inferior to men. No, you can still say that men are hierarchically, should be higher than women and still say that they're also, by the way, equal, right? Different senses, uh, as an example, right? But these people take the extreme and, and, you know, when they see the hierarchical ordering, they, you know, it turns into class warfare. It turns into gender warfare. It turns into, you know, different kinds of, you know, financial, etc. That's how human beings today in a dialectical manner, whether, you know, we could talk about Marxism or any other political ideology. Dialectics is the very basis of these ideas that are formed by these people. But orthodoxy completely transcends the dialectic in these responses. So when you when you hear these responses, in fact, you're hearing something even more than this. You're hearing more than just, just a simple response to biblical passages. You are really listening to fundamental understandings of what reality really is and the basis of that reality. Sanger Theologian says, not of the one people saw, but of the word. In fact, there was a duality about him. And then he says, although both together make a single whole, it is by combination, not by nature. What could be more straightforward? What is he saying here? He's talking about the two natures of Christ. He says that, that the people didn't only saw his, the people didn't only see his humanity, they also saw his divinity, because there was a duality about Christ. Christ is dual. And then he says. The two natures make a single whole, so a single hypostasis. They're composed together, so you have a single composite hypostasis. What is the hypostasis composed of? The two natures. But the hypostasis and nature are distinct, right? So the hypostasis in and of itself is still a divine simple hypostasis, right? But it is, again, you can still call it composite because what is it composed of? Again, to nature. St. Maximus the Confessor says, for example, that Christ is, he says that he is God by hypostasis, he's divine by hypostasis, but human by nature. Right? Uh, so there is not a human hypostasis, there is not a human person in Christ, but the two natures make a single whole, and this combination is what is one. This combination in his hypostasis, in his person, is one. But the nature is not one, it is two. What could be more straightforward? Yes, what could be more straightforward, St. Gregory? What could be more straightforward? Yeah, if it was that straightforward for me, 
I won't have like more than 10 hours of content against people that deny what he's saying here. Um, another argument uh, ag ag against um, Christ receives divine attributes like life, judgment, power over all flesh instead of having it in him. These are ascribed to his flesh receiving these things, although it won't be incorrect to say that this applies even to his divinity, for he receives his nature from the Father. And so these natural characteristics come in his nature, but the nature is from the Father. So Christ has these divine attributes in himself, but the nature that he has, that he exists in, you know, his existence is in his, you know, is begotten, is generated from the Father. And so John 5, 19, the Son can do nothing of himself, but only what he sees the Father doing, because the divine will and divine activity is the activity of the Father, and the Son does what the Father does. So the Father follows the divine will, uh, the, the Son follows the divine will of the Father, because that is his, by nature, his divine will too. And so it does not restrict his nature if he follows what his Father is doing. In fact, Following what his father is doing is the very personal mode in which he exists and operates in the world, in creation. John 6.38, the son is coming down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. So the son does not have a distinct will to the fathers, for what is mine is not distinct from what is yours, but belongs to both you and me, who have one will as we have one Godhead. But Christ does not do his own will, that is, he doesn't do a will that is contrary to the Father's. He does the will of the Father, which is actually paradoxically his will. It's just that it is not his own will in exclusion to his Father, because he doesn't even have his own will in exclusion to his Father's. You see, he is in fact the living will of the Father. That is, he manifests the will of his Father in earth, in creation. But he also has a human will because he has a human nature. So he does not do things according to his own human will. Um, his, he humanly follows the divine will by his own human free choice. So Christ in a human way freely chooses to follow God as well. So his human will does not, although it is obedient and follows the divine will, let's be very careful, it's actually very dangerous to say that the human will is uh, subservient and... and uh, you know, controlled by the divine will. No, the human will freely follows the divine will. The, the idea that the human will is in a tyrannical submission to the divine will is a monophylite heresy. Then we have, oh, another darling Bible quote. The Father is the one true God, John 17, 3. None is good except for God, Mark 10, 18 and Luke 8, 19, 18, 19. So, Father is the sole true God. First of all, the being one true God doesn't exclude Christ. Right? It excludes false gods. Since John 17, 13 continues and Jesus Christ. We can even uh, look this up. Uh, Oh, people are now talking about Immaculate Conception. Dude, we're talking about St. Gregory the Theologian, not Immaculate Conception. Get out of here. That's one thing I don't tolerate. We're not talking about Immaculate Conception or anything stupid like that. We, I, talked about, I have a video on Immaculate Conception. It's on the St. Uh, John Maximum, which is book. Go watch that. No. It's a stupid discussion. Craig Truly already has various different articles, in fact, uh, refuting Immaculate Conception, supposedly being in the Byzantine Fathers. No, it isn't. It isn't. It's based on quote mining and by taking things out of context. And it is also such a fringe topic to just endlessly discuss about. It's incredibly cringe to hear this. Anyways... John 17, 13, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, right? Uh, but even if, even if, right, even if we understood the, you know, one true God statement, right? the Father is the one true God. Well, 
one true God in the sense that he is the very source of divinity, okay, yes. Guess what? We have many church fathers accepting that terminology applied only to the Father. Does that mean that being one true God and being exclusive for the Father ex excludes the Son, the Holy Spirit, from being God? No. What does, what does it mean that you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to be the one true God? Ask them this and they're, they're, they're just, it just means being God. It just means being God. It could mean being the, being the source, principle, fountainhead of divinity. And that's a character only the Father has. And that's a hypostatic characteristic. So, again, it only proves the Orthodox position, in fact. Uh, for some reason, I yeah. Um, so, none is good except for God. Because, the, because goodness does not have its source in anything else other than divine nature. Only God is goodness himself. Man is only good insofar as he participates in God's goodness. So Christ is not making a reference to whether he is God or not. He's saying, why are you calling me good? Only God is the source of goodness. In fact, there's also a double entendre. I mean, he's kind of saying, you know, you call me good, but only God is good. So what are you calling me? You know, like it's kind of like calling me God, right? So there's there's also that interpretation as well. So in fact, again, so actually that verse affirms the divinity of the Son. Does not reject the divinity of the Son. Um, and another another verse that you know means used to argue that the Son was subordinate to the Father was Hebrews seven twenty five that Christ ever living. That uh, ever living to appeal for us is ever living to appeal for us. Um, Christ appeals for us because he is truly man. So appealing to us does not imply subordination. Mark 13, 32, another darling quote, another darling passage of these quote miners, right? No one except the Father knows the last day or hour, not even the Son himself. Oh, the Son doesn't know the hour, that means the Son is not God. Well, there are two responses that you can use. First of all, Christ does not know as man. So he assumes in his humanity, because in scripture we say that uh, Christ grew in wisdom and knowledge. But how can God grow in wisdom and knowledge? Well, if he humanly appropriates the condition, so he self-limits himself in his humanity to not know things, then we can ac accurately say these things about him. So we can piously admit ignorance to his humanity, although in his divinity he still knows everything. How is that even? How is that even possible? Well, Saint Kirill makes this argument first of all, but I will argue that first of all, self-limiting, right? So people will, will will say this: "Oh, self-limiting." So you're saying that God limited Himself? No, because there's different forms of it, right? There's limiting oneself in the sense of like literally losing that ability, right? So let's, um, so for example, let's say, oh, God limit. Now, does that mean that we're saying that God is not omnipresent anymore? Or are we saying something actually completely different? We could be saying something completely different, in fact. Uh, and the... The meaning of Mark thirteen thirty two is is also that kind of the kind of the understanding is not only that he assumes ignorance in his humanity, right? Although he still knows everything as God, it is also that he's kind of he's basically just saying, "Don't ask me about the hour. It is not up to you to know the hour, right?" Um, So I believe, uh, yeah, so Christ does not know as man, but he knows as God. And he also says this in order to get these people off his back because people were asking about him, you know, when's, when's the end times coming? Can you tell me, you know, exact date and time? Give me, give me an exact date and time, etc. No, he's not going to give it to you. Now, the self-limitation, again, is by appropriation, right? So uh, it, is, it is an experience, a condition that Christ... Un goes through by appropriation. If Christ was unable to go through this experience, 
then you are actually really setting a genuine limit in God's infinite power. This is where I was going to kind of get, get into, but for some reason my brain, brain stopped. But the main argument here is actually it's the other way around. If you imply that God's self-limiting himself in a non-absolute manner, that's the term I was looking for, non-absolute manner, so non-absolute limitation. If God cannot limit himself in a non-absolute manner by assuming a weaker condition, then you're basically saying that God is unable to control his own power. But isn't God, doesn't he move himself? Isn't he the self-mover? So doesn't he have full control over his own power? Which includes being able to manifest it and being able to, choosing not to manifest it in its fullness by assuming a condition that is ignorant, that is ignorance in a different nature to his, that is in his human nature. If it's impossible for God to do that, then you don't believe that God, God is omnipotent. You don't believe in his omnipotency. And before you say again, oh, you're saying, no, absolute limitation is impossible because it goes against his very character as God. It goes against the capacity, the power that he has as God, right? God cannot lose the capacity or the power to exist because it is the very inner life and capacity that he has in himself but now manifesting the power of omniscience, for example, well, he can choose to not manifest it in a specific point in time in his humanity. He can choose not to do so. If he cannot do that again, you are limiting God. So it's a, it's a reversal. It's a fun little reversal, but it is indeed Nevertheless, a reversal. So once you understand this Kirillian and really secular theologian's concept, but this Kirillian concept of um, non-absolute limitation, you will understand more the mystery of God in this regard. And um, when we say non-absolute limitation, we don't say that Christ adopted a gnomic will or anything like that. Christ still had full knowledge of good and evil, right? Uh, but gnomic will refers to the way in which a hypostasis particularizes his human will, right? Um, because the hypostasis of Christ is divine, he does not have a gnomic will. Because why? Gnomic will is something that is proper to created human hypostasis, which Christ did not have one. Uh, so, kind of to recapitulate the uh, the fourth theological oration, Singer theologian says that our starting point is that God in his essence cannot ever be comprehended. And Many of God's other titles, such as God and who he who he is, are based either on his power or providence. Uh, and then there's various different titles that he speaks about. If you want to read them yourself, you can read the work yourself, right? Uh, but that's, where he, that's how he ends the fourth theological oration. And so now we're in the fifth theological oration, oration on the Holy Spirit, oration 31. It's been, two, it's been more than two hours so far. Um... Yeah, so, yeah, there we go. How's it going, everyone? Still got some 57 likes so far. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, Adam did not have no McVilla prior to the fall. No, that's, that's actually, I know there's speculation, but I don't think that's true. Because no McVilla relates to seeing evil as an apparent good. How are you going to commit evil when you have knowledge of what is good and what is evil. That's kind of the problem, you see. It's one of the big, I used to believe that uh, no uh is a future of a fallen, created human hypostasis, but the problem is that you really have to have, you really uh, have to spend a lot of time, not even a lot of time, you have to really try hard to explain how Adam could sin before the fall, or how Eve could have sinned before the fall. That's the big problem with saying that. Um, that's from St. John Damascus. I don't think so, but if you can quote from that work, that would be interesting. But uh, let's move on. All right. 
All right, let's move on to the last theological oration. And then we have the two letters of Thedonius, which is, again, going to be very short. The fifth theological oration, oration on the Holy Spirit, oration 31. Although, so now this is getting into one plus one plus one equal three. Oh, but oh, how God won if he three? Oh, the two, three, two. You know, St. Gregor Theologian explains this in Oration 31. He says, God is one because his divinity is one. So although it's three persons, their divinity, their godness is one. The name God refers to the energy. Anything that we know of God is a divine energy. Even the yes, you know, even the essence. Now this might be this might sound very strange. So God's divine essence is an energy. Now, what do we mean by that? Again, the title, the name that is given to God's essence, and this is in Saint Dionysius the Areopagite. He says that God is a uh, uh, usio hyper usio, or some uh, super substantial essence. So essence beyond essence. So even God's essence is actually beyond essence to the point where it's we're basically using a name, you know, to describe the essence. But we're kind of just saying we don't even know it, right? We don't even have knowledge of it. We only have knowledge of it insofar as what comes from the essence in the form of divine energies. Essence includes one of those names, in fact. Uh, so when we say... So when we say divine essence, for example, does that mean that we're saying energy? Not necessarily so. It is just that, again, the knowledge of it is in the form of energy. But um, uh, what we know of from the essence is also energy. So simplicity, etc. These things that positively attribute to God. This is why, you know, negative attributions, positive attributions, there's a distinction between the two. And how we understand understand either of them but to kind of get back on point god is one because his divinity is one uh for example the father is light the son is light the holy spirit is light but the light itself is one there's only one light um psalm 36 9 says for with thee is the fountain of life in thy light shall we see light in thy light shall we see light hmm. i mean it seems like it's the same light but there's the father's light and then there's the son's light that we're going to be seeing. Uh, you know, or maybe the fountain of life, you know. Uh, St. Gregory the Theologian says, We receive the Son's light from the Father's light, in the light of the Spirit, from the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Right? So all divine activities, all divine energies, are from the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. So the love of the Father is through the Son, completed and manifest in the Holy Spirit. Or creation of the world is from the Father through the Son, and the grace of creation is filled in with the Holy Spirit. The incarnation. This is something people have been asking a lot these days, but every time I give them the answer, they, I don't know, I don't know what happens, but um, it seems like a lot of people don't really, I don't know what, if they don't understand it or like don't know what's going on, but incarnation is another example. Incarnation is a divine activity is a divine act that god undertakes the incarnation is done from the father through the son taken on human nature in the holy spirit with the holy spirit you know with the son getting his human nature from the holy spirit and the virgin mary so that's how the incarnation is done so does that mean that and, and some uh so god incarnates as man but each of the divine persons fulfills an activity in their proper hypostatic mode. That's what St. Maximus the Confessor says. So the Father does things according to his goodwill. That's what from means. The, the Son does the divine activities according to, um, according to economy. So according to, you know, things out like him accomplishing the things in him. And the Spirit completes things. You know, he does acts according to consent and so he fulfills the divine activities the holy spirit fulfills the divine activities so the son takes on human nature but it is fulfilled in the holy spirit with the father according to his good will sending the son to become man the incarnation is a one divine activity that is triadic all activities in the world uh, they're all triadic activities um 
So to get back on the... Adam had original innocence. He knew goodness without deliberation. Uh, oh, does he use the term goodness without deliberation? But the thing with, the thing with that quote, St. Maximus the Confessor himself says, deliberation has like 28 meanings in the Bible. So it's a... Uh, it might, the deliberation St. John Damascus uses might not be the same deliberation St. Maximus the Confessor uses. Um, anyway, some guy posted some horrible thing in my server, apparently. Gotta delete that nonsense. Um, <clears throat> man, I gotta deal with this stuff while, while streaming. I don't even want to describe what like this guy posted. I don't know. I don't know what what, what are you even thinking when posting stuff like this? It was some guy dying in a working act work accident. That's all I'm gonna say. Anyways, um, uh, yes. So whatever can essentially be spoken of with regards to one person applies to the other person since they share the same essence. So one of the arguments again, you know, means used against the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is either a substance or an energy. If he's an energy, then he's acted but cannot act by himself. And he will also have to vanish when the activity ends. Yet the Holy Spirit acts, speaks, decrees, feels grief, and is vexed. So the Holy Spirit is not a divine activity. In fact, he is a divine person. He speaks as a divine person. He acts as a divine person. He decrees as a divine person. And the scriptural references, if you want to see them, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, Acts 13, 2, Ephesians 4, 30, and Isaiah 63, 10. And um, if the Holy Spirit is a is a substance, right? If the Holy Spirit is a substance, then he is either created or uncreated. It is impossible for there to be a mean in between. If he is a created substance, then why do we believe in him? Why do we worship him? And why are we baptized in his name? Therefore, the Holy Spirit has to have a divine substance, a divine nature. So the Holy Spirit, therefore, is a divine person. Uh because we're baptized in his name, because we believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's the proof of the divinity of the Holy Spirit from St. Gregory the Theologian. Um, then there's a there's an argument from the Holy Spirit supposedly being a brother of the Son. Because the whole isn't the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit is generated from the Father, so and the Son is also generated, so they have to be brothers. But the the manner in which God exists transcends all dialectics. The incredible theologian, I directly quote him, says, Thus God escapes your syllogistic toils and shows himself stronger than your exclusive alternatives. In translation, he says, God transcends your dialectics. There is not either unbegotten or begotten. So God is not a dyad. The feature of a dyad, according to Eunomians, is the dialectic of opposition. But the fact that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, not he's not begotten, but he proceeds from the Father, in fact, by, by doing so, the Trinity transcends the dyad, the dialectic of oppositions, to a triad. And so it has everything a monad and a dyad has positively in itself harmoniously without the dialectical oppositions and the logical contradictions. Right? So... Uh, he gets into the distinction between begetting and proceeding, but we cannot know the distinction. Why? Well, because we don't really fully comprehend conceptually even. We don't even know what divine begetting even is. We don't even know what divine proceeding even is. So since we don't even know these things fully, we can't really distinguish them. So we only know from Revelation. What does Revelation tell us? Revelation tells us that the Father is unbegotten. I mean, this is pretty clear. The Son is the, the only begotten Son of the Father in numerous different places. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, as John 15, 26 says. That's what Scripture tells us. That's what, why the Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Those are the hypostatic properties of each of the persons. But we don't know the distinction between begetting and proceeding. Because we can't know. 
Uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not have a defect compared to the other persons. Each hypostatic property allows them to retain their natural equality. And then Singer Theology used the Adam, Eve, and Set analogy for the Trinity. I've, you know, I've, uh, I've used this argument numerous times already, but for those who want to hear it again, Adam is unbegotten, like the Father. Seth is begotten, like the Son. And Eve proceeds from the Father, like the Holy Spirit. So the human nature exists in three modes, unbegotten, begotten, proceeding. Uh, God, who made man in his own image, also exists in these three modes, unbegotten, begotten, proceeding. It is just that divine, unbegotten, you know, divine modes of existing and human modes of existing are going to be different. Why are they different? Because they're different natures. They're different beings, right? Uh, divinity exists fully in each of the divine persons. Fully. There is only one God because there's only one Godhead. Divinity, Theotis. Uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa says God, Godhead is an energy, therefore there is one God of the divinity. And, you know, some people, Roman Catholics especially, use the, um, they, they have a polemic against St. Gregory of Palamas. They say, oh, St. Gregory of Palamas says there's a higher divinity and a lower divinity. So there are two divinities, right? That's what it must mean. I haven't read St. Gregory of Palamas. I've not read a single book of his. I just got this quote from some people in a basketball court speculating like a bunch of autists who think that we are in the end times, but they're all just going to die alone and going to go to hell if they don't repent. Oh, I'll just get my theology from those people because you know what? They sound very reasonable, even though they made prophecies about a, um, a pope being an, being an antichrist and that prophecy didn't come true. Oh, but let's, let's conveniently forget that, right? I think they said John Paul II was an, was an Antichrist and that after him, the world was going to end. Obviously, that didn't come to pass, right? These are false prophets. But, oh, yeah, let's listen to the, let's listen to the uh, unholy basketball court of stupid nerds. Oh, oh wait, I can't say these things. Why? Because they're going to sue me. Oh, they're going to sue me. I'm so scared, bro. You're going to sue me? Oh, you, what are you going to do? You're going to make a video against me, bro? Oh, oh, no. Hundreds and thousands of people are going to see me making fun of you, stupid, idiot, numb nuts. Oh, I'm so scared. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. Anyways, you see this argument from them. Oh, Gregory Palama says higher divinity and lower divinity. Well, guess what? Higher and lower divinity is relational. The higher, lower, that's relational. That's not metaphysically higher, metaphysically lower. So, what is an example of lower, higher, lower divinity? First of all, I showed in a, in a video on uh, Essence Energy's Distinction video from uh, St. Mark of Ephesus. He makes this argument. He actually responds to these arguments. Um, there are fathers that refers to the essence as Theotes, divinity, and the energy as Theotes, divinity. So, the essence is higher divinity. The, the energy of divinity is the lower divinity. What does that mean? Well, think of an ice pack, for example. Right, you apply it to your leg. The, the cold of that ice right, that is in the ice pack itself, by itself, that's a higher cold right, that exists in an ice pack. But when you apply it to the leg, that same cold goes to the leg. Now, does the effect of the coldness, is it different from the ice pack itself? Is it a different coldness? Well, if you're a basketball court nerd who sues everyone that, uh, that they're scared of, yeah. Yeah, of course it is, because you're dumb, you're an idiot, you live in a trailer park, and you don't know what you're talking about. But if you actually have a brain, and you know how metaphysics work, you know that the cold of the ice pack that is applied to you, like the effect of it is not different. It is not metaphysically different, but it's a lower cold because it is applied to it. So there's a relation, right? So the divinity we get in creation is from the divine essence but we are getting the effects of the divinity, the uncreated divinity, the divine energy itself. But we're not getting the divine essence as if, you know, we become gods or anything like that. But we get it in the form of his divine grace. Uh, yeah, that's the greater theologian, by the way. That's St. John Damascus, the St. Maximus, the confessor. All of these people that you hate. Oh, by the way, how is your Uniate church going? I hope you're having a fun time there. Um, anyways. Hope you're having a fun time going to Uniate Church while attacking uh, Eastern theology. Have fun there, right? All of these people who are anti-Orthodox, they're all, notice, all of these people who are anti-Orthodox, they're all in Uniate circles. 
basketball court people, they were in uni eight circles. They're not anymore, but they were in uni eight circles. Uh, Maylor Tartshart, I think, no, he's not uni eight. He's SSPX now. Um, Trent Horn, uni eight. Lol Cal, uni eight, right? Just one other guy that was um, Flanders, uni eight, right? All of these people are uni eights. It's almost as if they know we're right, but they just want to worship the Pope. Because their religion is Pope worship. Their religion isn't the religion of St. Gregory Theologian. None of what I'm talking about, these people don't believe this. They think that everything I'm talking about is just Neopalamite BS. That's what they think. They haven't even read St. Gregory Theologian, right? And if they did, they would probably try to desperately find like some statements. Oh, St. Gregory Theologian says the Holy Spirit is an uncreated substance. That proves us, bro. That proves us. I am a created substance of man. Does that mean I'm identical to the universal human nature of man? No, right? Uh, come on. You have, God gave you a brain. God gave you a soul. God gave you a mind so that you can use it for good purposes, not for being an idiot. All right? So don't, let's not be idiots here. Let's, not, let's be smart men and understand what is being said here. So that is how we understand higher divinity and lower divinity. It's not metaphysically, it's the same divinity, right? But the divinity is the divine energy that we're getting. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, you're going to, you know, a couple of months later, you're going to say, dude, we met white exposed. He lives in this, this, he lives in Turkey and he has his home address. We have his real name, right? So, go, oh, man. Oh, man, I'm so scared. Um, this idea of, hello. Yeah, so the idea of divine unity between the three persons is fundamentally different to human unity because some people will say, well, okay, so the divine persons, the Trinitarian divine persons, um, the divine persons are, aren't they, you know, they're three persons, but they have one will. But we are many human persons, but yet we have different wills. Your will is not mine. We have different wills. How is that possible? How does that make sense? That's because there is no separation in God. There is no separation in God. But in we are separated from each other. So we are separated in our will. So I will something different than you do, even though we still have the same human will. They, The person, the Trinity, are not separate from each other, so they will the same exact thing always. There is no opposition with each other. There's always unity in actions. Um and so, yes, yeah, Sanger Theology says the humans are composite, divisible, and separate from one another, but the persons of the Trinity aren't. Therefore, there is no separation in active. For example, polytheists, on the other hand, deny the idea of divine unity in activities. There is none of such. Romans uh, 11, 36, For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. St. Gregory says, From whom applies to the Father, through whom to the Son, and in whom applies the Holy Spirit. This is also what St. Basil the Great says in On the Holy Spirit. It says the same exact thing. St. Gregory uh, heavily critiques the arguments of, oh, this is not in the Bible. Oh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Oh, that's another great, beautiful, another beautiful argument, right? This is not in the Bible, bro. It's not in the Bible. This is not in the Bible, man. This, uh, it, so you're saying that you believe in the Trinity, but the Trinity is not in the Bible. Uh, the Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. So does that mean the concept of the Trinity is not in the Bible? No. You can use different names, but the concept is still the name. You can call it whatever you want, right? But, it, but what matters is if it goes to the concept of what we're explaining that we know of today as the Trinity. He says, there really is a great deal of diversity inherent in names and things. So why are you so dreadfully servile to the letter, so much the partisan of Yiddish lore, following the syllables while you let the realities go? So he's basically calling these people Talmudic. You guys are Talmudic. Um, this applies to a lot of people we've seen in the last couple of months, last couple of years even. Um, whether they're Roman Catholic or... Um, Oriental Orthodox, they, they make the same exact word concept fallacy mistake. Those who constantly complain about that, you got to have this special formula. Where is the special formula, dude? The St. Peter of Alexandria says one incarnate nature of God, the word. Uh, the, 
Oh, we have quotes from the church fathers. They say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So it's the filioque, bro. You got to accept the filioque because it says there in the word. It's a, the word it says the word. It says the word. It says the word, bro. The word is said. It's the, it said the word is said, bro. It's in the paper. It's in the paper. Oh, you're telling me I need to read the full work for myself? What you what, what you talking about? Right? But you need to understand the concepts holistically. And this is why we need to understand the Bible holistically and the doctrines holistically as well. Uh, one can reach the same concept in reality by using completely different words. And so finally, and we're kind of getting to the end of the fifth theological oration, there are three stages of revelation. Old Testament, which reveals the Father. New Testament, which reveals the Son. And after Acts, right? After Pentecost, which reveals the Holy Spirit. And it's still being revealed to us. So even revelation is triadic. And the reason why there is progressive revelation in this regard, it is for us. It is for our weakness, right? We were not ready to understand the Son. We were not ready to understand the Holy Spirit. But you can still see from Scripture, especially the Old Testament, you can still see the, the hints there. You can see this in the hints in the Old Testament. If you look at my commentary on the book of Genesis, it's very clearly there, right? Uh, and so, and, and the manifestation of God's revelation is the strongest in the Holy Spirit. Does that mean the Holy Spirit is a stronger God? No, it's because that's his personal hypostatic mode of manifesting the energy of revealing God's, you know, revelation to all of us. The strongest because the hypostatic mode in which the revelation is manifested is manifested in the Holy Spirit. He is the purest expression of the divine energy. This is not to say the Father or the Son are impure expressions but what I am saying, me, that is, because this is my, my writing, what I am saying is related to creation. Revelation is in three stages, from the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. When it goes from the Father, we have a heart. We have a heart to understand the depiction of God. But the Son comes and gives us a stronger path to the Father, and allows us to know the Father. But it is really the Holy Spirit that opens our eyes and allows us to see God properly. And for us to see what is truly going on. Um, and then... Uh, he posts other biblical quotes to prove the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, yeah. So, yeah. That concludes the five theological orations so far, but we still got two letters. This is going to be the shorter part. Uh, two and a half hours is pretty long. Okay, you know, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a nice conclusion, hopefully, I think so, uh, in our little own bubble here, ladies and gentlemen, hope you're having fun, and remember, go to church on Sunday, um, I woke up recently, so I will go, personally, yeah, those you know, people will be like, David, it's 2 a.m., what are you doing, streaming on YouTube, streaming on YouTube, because I woke up four hours ago, Five hours ago, I got a, I got a little, uh, I got a funky sleeping schedule. All right, but um, yeah. So the letters to Cladonius. So the letters to Cladonius, Saint Gregory the theologian is arguing against Apollinarianism, but at the same time, at that time, there was what we will call Proto-Nestorianism. So in fact, when he makes his anatomas, he's making anatomas against what will no, be known later as Nestorianism. He makes he anatomatizes those who believe in two sons. He anatomatizes those who believe that Christ worked uh, divine things only through the grace as a prophet. He anatomatizes these beliefs regularly, and um, and uh, he also says that he starts by saying. That those who do not accept Mary as the mother of God are anathema. And there is also a distinction of nature and persons in a nature and person in St. Gregory. He says, whoever imports two sons, one from God the Father, a second from the mother, and not one of the same son, loses the adoption promised to those who believe all right. Two natures there are, God and man, since there are both soul and body, but not two sons or two gods. Look at this. Just like man is two natures, body and soul, in Christ there are two natures, but not two sons or two gods. 
Though Paul spoke of the inner and outer man, we are not dealing with two human beings. In some, the constituents of our Savior, Savior are different things, since invisible and visible, timeless and temporal are not the same. But not different people, God forbid. The pair is one by coalescence, God being in man and man deified, or however we are to put it. I say different things, meaning the reverse of what is the case in the Trinity. Meaning the reverse of what is the case in the Trinity. What does that mean? What, is, what does St. Gregory mean by that? Well, the Trinity is one nature and three persons, right? One nature, three apostasis. But in Christ, it is the reverse. So there's one hypostasis. How many natures then can there be in Christ? Two, right? Humanity and divinity. So in Christ, it's the reverse. It's the opposite of the case in God. And guess what? He, he continues saying, I say different things mean the reverse of what is this case in the Trinity. There we have others in order not to confuse the subjects or hypostasis, others being the natures, but not other things. The three are one and the same thing qua Godhead. Now, there's another point St. Gregory the theologian gives. He says, If any shall say that it wrought in him by grace as in a prophet, but was not and is not united with him in essence, let him be empty of the higher energy or rather full of the opposite. What does this mean? This means that in Christ there was a union of two essences in his person. Divine essence and human essence or divine nature and human nature. What do you want to call it? Guess how Severus of Antioch, for example, interprets this passage. He says, oh, when he says essence, he actually means hypostasis. I'm not kidding. I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating. I can literally refer to you the letter right now. If you think that I'm playing, I am playing. All right? I am playing. Uh, here we see letter two to Ecumenicus. He says, Neither do we deny, as we have also written other letters on different occasions, that we often find men designating hypostasis by the name of essence. Hence, Gregory the theologian named hypostatic union, union in essence, in the letter to Cladonius, which we have just mentioned. Which, and then he quotes the part that I quoted. Pure cope, right? It's pure cope. I mean, the whole apologetic of St. Gregory the theologian is establishing that God is one nature and three persons. And then he says, well, actually, sometimes he does say nature's persons. What? That goes against the whole thing that he's trying to do. This whole project, you can say, that he's trying to establish. Uh, what is unassumed is unhealed. So if God did not assume a mind, the mind in man is not healed. If Christ is supposed to be a man but has no mind, then he is not a man. The divinity makes up for the human mind. Is not a legitimate argument since there is still a lack of a human mind, even if its functions might be there. St. Gregory then goes on to argue against the impossibility of having two natures, in which he says that incorporeal things can have plurality without division. For example, a human being has soul, reason, mind, and Holy Spirit. These things do not make man four or five different things, but rather distinct faculties of man's nature. This is a very crucial argument, by the way. It says that distinct things in incorporeal beings does not, first of all, cause any form of composition even. Right? He says that the soul is simple, but the soul has many faculties. The soul has many faculties, even though it is simple. So there are many distinct things in the soul. I mean, the Holy Spirit is in the soul. Mind is in the soul. Reason is in the soul, right? But these are all distinct from the soul, distinct from each other, but they're still faculties of the soul, and they do not destroy the simplicity of the soul. So even in human beings, you can have distinction without composition. Even in human beings. St. Gregory Theologian goes as far as to say that, that even in human beings you can have that. The mind was assumed because it needed salvation. There is no point in God assuming flesh if the flesh wasn't sinful, but the mind was. God incarnated to heal us from sin. Flesh and soul in the Bible refer to human nature at times, so they don't refer to they don't exclude the other. John 1.14 says Christ assumed flesh because he assumed and became sin for us, not by sinning, but by accepting the sick consequence of sin, such as death, tiredness, etc. Uh, St. Gregory attacks the idea of a lack of continuity from the time of apostles. If the faith started 30 years ago, nigh on 400 years having passed since Christ appeared, 
Our gospel, meanwhile, has been long empty, our faith empty, and the martyrs witnessed in vain. In vain did such great governors stand at the head of the people, courtesy of these verses and not the faith. So, to, to argue that the faith kind of had an interregnum at a set time, and then just, you know, you continue to have the true faith in the 16th century, for St. Gregory Theologian is ludicrous, it's unacceptable. And that will kind of conclude the two letters, in fact, to Clodonius and man, am I tired? Um, so uh, it's been it's been more than two and a half hours. Uh, if anyone has, well, really, we don't seem to have. Yeah, we don't have more super chats. Well, thank you for the support, everyone. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the shares and and the nice live chat activity. And this will this should conclude the video. Hopefully, you learned something new. Hopefully, it was beneficial. I want to finish before I finish. I want to give the Patreon shout outs to my to my bros out there. Um, the relationship manager as of today is yeah. Thank you to Stephen, Vlad, Kerry, Ignatius, Mike, Jack, Teresa, Nectarius, Flooded Basement, Dave, Colton, David, and Norbert. Thank you all for supporting this channel appreciate all of you and thank you all for watching the stream listening to the words that i had to say and uh, hopefully this stream was and video was beneficial for you uh, i will see you all in the next video or stream thank you all for watching goodbye and go to church